Good afternoon, everyone. I'll now call the workshop to order at 4.38 p.m. Ms. Bellotta, please call the roll. District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Alexandria Ayala. Here. District 3, Karen Burrell. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. Here. District 6, Marsha Andrews. Here. And District 7, Deborah Robinson. Here. Well, we have quorum, all seven board members in attendance. Also joining us is Superintendent Michael Burke, General Counsel Sean Bernard, Inspector General Teresa Michael, and Board Clerk Tony Bellotta. Senior staff members will join us periodically as directed by the Superintendent. Would you all please stand for the pledge to be led by the Superintendent? Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Viewers and listeners can access the meeting today by either watching on Comcast channels 234 and 235, UVerse channel 99, or by using the YouTube link on our webpage at palmbeachschools.org. In the event that the link is interrupted for technical reasons, please switch over to the TV channels. All board meetings are recorded in their entirety and posted on the district website within 24 hours. We also offer a listening-only option which the public can access by calling 561-357-5900 or toll-free at 1-866-930-7015. The meeting ID is 1561-880-1124, pound sign. This meeting is being transcribed by a closed captioner, so remember to speak at a reasonable pace. Superintendent takes us to the first workshop. Yes, sir. We have four workshops for you today. Our first one, I'm, we're going to invite up the friends from Your Education Foundation, Mr. James Gavrilos, President and CEO, and Mr. James Moore, Chairman of the Board, and also Resident DJ for Palm Beach County Schools. This is part of a, our agreement with the Ed Foundation. They give us an annual report and uh, an update on all the great work they're doing to support our schools. Thank you, Superintendent Burke, <clears throat> Chairman Barbieri, and members of the school board. As Superintendent Burke just alluded in the memo of understanding that we established with the school district um, two years ago with then Chief Financial, Financial Officer Mike Burke, um, each year we present an annual report to the school board, so we are fulfilling that requirement today for two years. We're going to be looking at fiscal year 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022. So we're going to be kind of giving you two annual reports. Uh, the second part of that MOU um, said that in return for the support you give the Ed Foundation, we are to bring a minimum of $1 million of value to the school district. And as we get into the report, you'll see that we have far and away exceeded that. I am joined to my right by the chairman of the board of the Education Foundation, the DJ extraordinaire. Uh, we often forget that this is not his job. Uh, Jim Moore uh, is with United Healthcare, who is one of our most supportive champions of education uh, and, and our outstanding chairman of the board. You see me surrounded by lots of red shirts, and we'll get to them later on. <clears throat> so as you're following along, uh, again, you know, the executive summary of who we are, I think you're, you're well informed. We are a staff of eight and a half. Um, the half who could not be with us, a name certainly familiar to this group, is Becky Youngman, who works with us part-time. Obviously, she is in Amsterdam and therefore unable to be with us. Uh, we will be talking about our, our programs today that we've delivered, uh, diverse programs and grants supporting our K-12 through public schools with a focus on targeting our highest needs Title I schools. <clears throat> like a good mystery novel, I'm going to get to the good part now, Chairman Barbieri. Um, we are as per our MOU to bring $1 million in value uh, to the school district. So for these two fiscal years, that number should be $2 million. Uh, I'm proud to say that over the last two years, we have brought $5.6 million in value uh, to the Palm Beach County School District. And when I say we, well, you can clap for that. I'll take that. <laughs> Um, when I say we, it really is the business community who stands so supportive of the work we do, as exemplified by not only United Healthcare, but so many of our champions of education. We simply are the conduit uh, from the local business community to the school district. Uh, we do this by supporting our schools with a number of various programs that we're going to be looking at through this presentation, uh, through our companies, through our champions of education who fund these various programs, and certainly working closely with the school district. Everything we do is consonant with the school district's strategic plan. There are a number of things that we provide for the school district. We're going to be looking at our CFEF matching grant program uh, shortly, also our Go Teach grants. 
So we do, actually there are three buckets of our grants, the CFEF matching grant, the GoTeach grant, and then our program specific grant, which refer to the career academies that we are providing the funding for. And we'll be looking at those numbers very shortly. Obviously our signature program is Red Apple Supplies, and I'll be giving you an update on that. The other services at the bottom of that uh, de uh, deck refer to things that we just do to assist the school district. We are the fiscal agent for about 40 or 45 different accounts. We do this at no charge to the district. This is just one of the services we provide. Um, I would say something that won't even show up in this report, not included in that $5.6 million of value, but during the shutdown, uh, there was an additional million dollars that flowed through the Education Foundation to the district from the Jacobus Foundation. Uh, $500,000 to support the purchase of Chromebooks and another $500,000 to support our food service workers. So we were the, the, the pass-through for that. We worked closely with Catherine Jacobus, and I would just share with the board at this time that Ms. Jacobus did pass away in December, and we certainly thank her for her support of public education and all she did for our district during uh, the pandemic. Let's talk about Red Apple Supplies first. Um, over my monthly board reports, I think you know, you, you've got the highlights, but you're going to see that in just five and a half years, we've gone from an idea uh, in the mind of Meredith Trim to as we close out this fiscal year, which is the gray panel on your far right, uh, we are now serving 76 schools, uh, which is a 21% a, a increase when you look at the total. Uh, very happy to say that as of last week when we closed our teacher shops, uh, this year Red Apple Supply distributed $1,442,008.78 in school supplies in those 76 schools. Um, I think we are all aware there are some big plans for the future for Red Apple Supply. As we look at our future growth, uh, the land, uh, which we have uh, agreed on the lease, and in, I would say, the next 60 to 90 days, uh, we will be sharing the launch of a capital campaign to raise the funds, which will build that facility that will allow us to serve every one of our 179, and I guess, Frank, we can now say 180 schools uh, as, as the school comes online down in Boca Raton. Uh, our goal is that no teacher should ever have to purchase school supplies out of their own pockets. As you look at the growth from 2021 to 2022, you'll see that teacher shops went from 1,503 up to 2,348. Uh, serving approximately 52,131 students. At this point, I would pause to commend Tarnisha Hatton, who is on my left. Oh. Tarnisha is our Director of Warehouse Operations, a proud graduate of Palm Beach Gardens High School. She's local. We like to keep... The I, I, I knew we'd get one of those. She's one of mine. <laughs> yes, Mrs. McQuinn, we know you're at Palm Beach Gardens High School. <laughs> but uh, Tarnisha's a proud local uh, graduate, and she is our director of warehouse operations. Lloyd Evans, who is behind me on your right, is the manager of Red Apple Supply. Um, I will be introducing you to the team today. Now, Chairman Barbieri, you have been very kind over my tenure here, um, saying some nice things about the work that, that I've done. The truth is, and I, and I don't say this with any false humility, I could be replaced by a trained squirrel. But were any of these eight people to step aside, the Education Foundation would crumble. Uh, they are the hardest working nonprofit staff in Palm Beach County, and it's an honor to be part of them. So Tarnish and Lloyd deserve all the credit uh, for the growth in Red Apple and the growth that is to come. It would be a very big squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would, Frank. I got nothing to say. I got to buy a vol. You got me, Frank. Uh, again, I think we've talked about um, the growth just in pure numbers. I would say other things that we've added to Red Apple Supply in the last year and a half has been our, our capability to deliver uh, with contributions from the Bachelor Foundation, from the Honda Classic, and the Frederick A. DeLuca Foundation. We were able to purchase a truck 16 months ago, which now allows us to actually not only deliver um, the teacher shops to the schools, but also when we get large quantity of donations. And Ms. Andrews, you've been very gracious in meeting us. and. And in fact, if you've never seen Marcia Andrews work a pallet jack, you should see it. This, this lady can unload a truck with the best of them. So the point here being, we have made a major shift in, in Red Apple supply operations from a more retail-based operation to a much more online operation. And as we move into our new facility uh, with Lloyd and Tarnisha leading the way, that is going to be the path. We're trying to make this as convenient as possible for our teachers. The location which the district has allowed us to lease uh, is dead center in this district. It could not be more convenient right off I-95. And so teachers have the option of coming to Red Apple and picking up their supplies that have been pre-boxed by our volunteers, or we will then deliver to the schools. 
So whatever we can do to make it convenient for the teachers is where we're going with Red Apple. Uh, we are very excited about the future. Again, I'm, I'm giving you a teaser that I would say around August or September when we launch the capital campaign, uh, I think we're going to have some very good news to share with you on the fundraising and our ability to get that project started uh, a whole lot sooner than people think. During these last two years, and it's the, these two fiscal years uh, that I am providing an overview for, as part of our grant work, uh, we made some shifts. Obviously, the first thing we had to do was make sure that every child had a Chromebook. Uh, we immediately swung into action, and I, I need to give the credit here to Thomas Bean, who was at Florida Power and Light, has now moved over to Next Era Energy. Uh, Dr. Fenoy made the decision to shut the schools down on March 13th. At 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, March 14th, Thomas Bean was on the phone with me saying, what can we do? What do you need us to do? And I'm saying this to the school board, when I talk about the success of the Ed Foundation, it is partners like United Healthcare, like Florida Power and Light, who don't wait to be asked. I mean, Thomas Bean, 9 o'clock in the morning, what do we need to do to make sure that every kid has what they need? And in a matter of weeks, uh, we were able to raise $124,354, which, uh, which was used to purchase 717 new and gently used devices, many of which were also donated by our partners over at Office Depot. Uh, the young lady to my left, Teresa Dabrowski, is our director, uh, she's our chief engagement officer. That means she's the fundraiser. Uh, when Teresa speaks to you, just, just get the checkbook out, Frank. Uh, just whatever you're doing, <laughs> just stop and get your checkbook out. Um, she encouraged us to shift for something called Kits for Kids. When all was said and done, uh, we distributed 5,097 kits with over $94,000 in school supplies. And that was going to the school sites that were doubling for feeding and getting those kits into the hands of the students who needed them. Oh, skipped one, sorry about that. Reducing the digital divide is something that we've been working on for the last two years. Uh, Jennifer Etheridge, who is our program and grants director, to my right. Uh, Jennifer, as you know, is a, a former principal. She was head of school at Pace School for Girls. By the way, Teresa is herself a former teacher of 12 years, so we've got quite a few educators here. While I'm doing this, Sam Pasley to my right uh, is himself a former Palm Beach County uh, school teacher. He was at Atlantic and a couple of other high schools. He is now an accountant, and we stole him, and he has been a, a godsend to us. Um, when you look at the digital divide, Jennifer Etheridge has headed that up. Uh, we raised just under a million dollars to purchase the Wi-Fi extenders, and I believe I've reported on that over a number of meetings. You're all very comfortable with where that program has gone. Happily, uh, working with Dr. Miller, who is one of the gems in your staff here, uh, and Melissa Tuno, uh, Mike Goldstein, uh, just an incredible group of people in that department. Uh, we are now online. Uh, the the Wi-Fi extender program is working in the glades. It has gone live in Lantana uh, two weeks ago, and other areas are quickly coming online. And this allows me to introduce to my immediate right Wiskendi Francois, uh, the latest addition to the Education Foundation staff. Wiskendi is our digital coach. He is bilingual. He speaks English and Creole. And he is actually going into the homes, meeting with the families who do not know how to get on the internet, who don't know how to boot up a computer or what happens when the computer doesn't boot up. So Wiskendi is our boots on the ground. And as we expand through these various areas, uh, he will be the one who will be working with these families, making sure that they can do everything they can so that the children can access the education and their parents can access uh, economic mobility. So Wiskendi is the latest member of our staff and we're, we're thrilled to have him on board. You see on the slide in front of you the foundations as well as uh, the, the local businesses that stepped up uh, for the digital inclusion initiative. Once I work through my presentation, members of the school board, if you have any questions about these, we'll, we'll certainly take them. Then we get to the grant side of the house. Again, we're reporting on two fiscal years. Uh, in 2020, uh, 2021, we had $1,478,654 in grants that went out for the programs that you see on the green uh, uh, pie chart in front of you. Some of our GoTeach, which we're going to talk about in a minute, Stepping Up STEM in Pahokee, uh, certainly the Healthcare Innovation Project. You're going to notice a, a drop when you look at 2021, 2022 to 945,000. And again, if you don't know numbers, I suspect Superintendent Burke, you know a number or two. Uh, you look at that pie chart and go, wait a minute, you're $500,000 below where you were last year. That's because last year we had the million dollars for the digital divide. That was kind of a one-off, excuse me for keep hitting that button. So when you look at this year's uh, CFEF matching grant program of $945,964, as I've said in past meetings, but now just to put a bow on all of this, we get funds from the state of Florida which are built into the budget. Those much, must be matched dollar for dollar by local companies uh, and not government dollars. 
And so if we're at Erica Whitfield Elementary School, I just promoted you, Ms. Whitfield, um, and you have a program and you say, oh, we can use part of our budget for the match. No, you can't, because that would be a government dollar. These have to come from the private sector. And, and Chairman Barbieri, when you look at the success of the Education Foundation, it is our business partners who step up, so much so that once we get our first round funding done, and I think, Jennifer, this year we're targeting about $350,000, give or take a few, there are a number of foundations across the state that can't hit their number. It might be 50, 60,000. That number goes back into the pot and we're allowed second round funding. Because of the support of the local business community, we're always able to match the second round funding, which might be another ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. And I would say last year, they even came back to us with third round funding. We were able to match that as well. And it just shows the incredible, incredible support that our public schools have from the local business community. So those are the CFEF matching grant programs which we are supporting in this fiscal year. Uh, again, you see the whole breakdown in front of you and all of you will have this obviously in your boxes. One of the matching grants that we're going to be uh, celebrating this year moving forward, as we announced at the previous school board meeting back in April, uh, happily we can say that the state of Florida Department of Ed has signed off on another career academy to train mental health technicians. Uh, under Dr. Miguel Benevente, who is another one of your hidden gems in this district. Uh, Dr. Benevente has been working on this project with Jennifer for a couple of years, and we are the first school district in the entire state of Florida to have a career academy that is training mental health workers. So again, uh, congratulations, Superintendent Burke, uh, Dr. Benevente, and everybody who does such a great job. Uh, that's one of our matching grant programs for next year, and I'll come report on that next year. A second of our grant program is the Go Teach grants. You will see that in the first of the fiscal years on which I am reporting, we distributed $120,000 in 74 grants. Uh, last year, that number rose to $189,813. Uh, there were 90 uh, Go Teach grants uh, involving 1,352 teachers in 65 schools, roughly 23,714 students. Uh, the growth in that program is attributed to the support of the Frederick DeLuca Foundation, certainly the CFEF matching program, and last year David Nicholson with the Stiles Nicholson Foundation stepped up with an elementary, middle, and high school grant of $5,000 each for STEM, and the second category was financial literacy. If you know David Nicholson, he's very, very devoted to financial literacy. So that's our Go Teach program. <clears throat> the last of our grant buckets is what we call our program specific. And then you see steady growth in that over the last three years, from 135,000 to 322,484 in the first fiscal year on which I'm reporting today. And then in this fiscal year, $393,483. These programs include the Fire Science Academy at uh, Palm Beach Lakes High School. Happily, I can tell you, they had their first graduation uh, two weeks ago on a Wednesday evening. Uh, this is the first cohort to come through there. And ladies and gentlemen of the school board, that room came unglued when the fire chief in Riviera stated that he had an opening and he was hiring one of the young people who graduated from the Palm Beach Lakes Fire Science Academy. This is a young man from Riviera Beach who has gone to our public schools, certified through the Fire Science Academy, thank you, J.P. Morgan Chase, and is now going back to Riviera Beach to serve the community as a firefighter. Hollywood could not write this script. Through the Frederick DeLuca Foundation, we are supporting the cybersecurity program at Santa Lucia's High School. And finally, with our good friends at Carrier, we are supporting the HVAC program at Royal Palm. <coughs> As we move into the next fiscal year, more to come. How do we do it? I, th I think this is self-explanatory. We work closely with our champions of education, uh, with the local business community, with local philanthropic foundations, and also through a couple of events, which allows me to introduce Angel Adams, another recent addition to our team on my fall right. Angel is our social media and marketing expert and is in charge of all of our events. So if you've ever been to our Heroes in Education 5K, our Distinguished Alumni Award, uh, the Go Teach Celebration, the recently held For Our Kids uh, Golf Tournament, which a number of construction companies put together for us, Angel Adams takes care of all of that. Our evolution, I think, is pretty self-explanatory there. We started out when I came uh, five years ago with a staff of five. Today, we like to say we're eight and a half uh, or nine. Uh, we'll, we'll make Becky a full person. We are a staff of nine. We have 36 board members. I would tell you we are in the enviable position that every charity wishes they were in. Uh, we have a waiting list. We have five people from very large companies in Palm Beach County who are begging us for a board position. Uh, but we currently are at our full complement uh, as uh, loaded uh, by our bylaws. And I, I want to take this moment, Superintendent Burke, to thank you. 
uh, and your predecessor, Dr. Fenoy, <coughs> for the outstanding, outstanding board representation from the school district, which would include yourself, uh, Jay Bogus, um, Ed Tierney, um, Leanne Evans, who is actually here uh, for the next workshop, and from the board side, uh, Karen Brill. You know, we cannot thank you, the, the five of you, and Dr. Glenda Sheffield. Uh, Dr. Sheffield, uh, a recent addition to our board this semester, who brings her acumen uh, as chief academic officer of the district. So we have just outstanding uh, representation on our school board, uh, on our foundation board from the school district. This is the slide I think that we want to pass on to those who need to see it. So Tallahassee, if you're listening, just take a picture of this and we're good. Um, as I said, we were to bring $1 million in value to the school district based on the MOU, uh, Mr. Burke, that, that you and I negotiated here three years ago. And you can see that in each of the last two fiscal years uh, on which I am reporting today, we exceeded $2.5 million of value in each of those years. Uh, I'd like to say we did a great job. We did. The, the team worked hard. They're an amazing, uh, amazing group of professionals. But it just points out to the support this school district has from the local business community. And I'm going to get to that in one more second. Where are we going? We want to experience slow, steady, managed growth at Red Apple Supply, which includes uh, the fundraising campaign to build our new facility. Uh, we hope to be in there in the next two years. We'd like to add one new uh, career academy each year as we move forward. We're finding that to be our sweet spot. We're going to expand our backpack initiative. Uh, Teresa Dabrowski to my left is, is relentless. Uh, as I like to say, the difference between a pit bull and Teresa is that a pit bull eventually lets go. Um, our backpack initiative has gone from 5,000 to 6,000 to 7,500, and this year we will be distributing 10,000 backpacks and all the school supplies needed uh, by students in our various schools. As we continue the growth of Red Apple, uh, we're finding you know, new ways to serve. High school kids have very different needs than elementary school kids. High school kids don't need crayons and scotch tape. They need things like flash drives. Um, if I may be direct and blunt, they need things like feminine hygiene products. Uh, with roughly 4,000 homeless kids uh, in our Palm Beach County public schools, there are a number of young women who miss two to three days per month quite simply because they don't have feminine hygiene products. And with uh, Jim Moore you know, connecting us to a couple of groups, we are actually now going to be able to start distributing some of that through Red Apple Supply. So as Red Apple Supply grows, we're not just adding new schools. I hope you as a school board understand it's not just breadth that's expanding, it's depth. We're adding schools every year. We're also adding new products to make sure that we're meeting the needs of our students. We're going to create an endowment, uh, which will generate some revenue each year to help offset the increase in operational expenses. Uh, and Teresa, in addition to everything else she does, will be working on a plan giving campaign. We will continue to invest in the human capital. As I've said, this is without a doubt the hardest working nonprofit staff I've ever had the honor to serve with. And we want to make sure that nobody here leaves and goes to any other charity or I will hunt them down and shoot them. <laughs> <clears throat> I talk about the business community. And here I'm going to turn it over to our chairman for a couple of minutes, uh, Mr. Jim Moore, who is with United Healthcare. When you look at our executive board and then our full board, you're going to see that most of the major companies in Palm Beach County are represented. Mr. Moore. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Again, as, a, as one of the business partners, we're excited to, to partner with the Ed Foundation because we know that the Ed Foundation is going off of your direction, your mission, to, and, and we're here to help complement that. Uh, too many times you get hit up from various uh, entities saying, oh, we're here to help education. And we're like, okay, well, how much of that actually goes into a classroom? And, and that's the exciting part here is we're able to get these backpacks to teachers, to the kids who need it. And when new supplies and new things are needed, the, these folks here are able to make it happen. Uh, so just excited on behalf of the, the entire business community to, to have this very close relationship to where the businesses who want to give to local education because they, they see all these great things you guys are doing, the, 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 the fire academy, the cyber academy, preparing our next work generation coming out ready to go is so exciting. Uh, and, that, and that's why we're in the enviable position to where we have all of our board members filled. Um, but with that said, you know, we, one of the big things that I'm challenging the Ed uh, Foundation board to do is we just got to, we got to ask at least two or three more other companies to join and, and, and get excited and, and be, be a part of this uh, to see the great things going on thanks to your leadership. So, 
When you look at our board, the last point I would make is, is this is a hands-on, very engaged board. Almost every major company in Palm Beach County uh, represented there. And I would say it goes from, you know, Meredith Trim. And we have to say again, it was Meredith who came up with the idea of Red Apple Supply. And when you think of where her vision started to where it is today and where it's going, uh, it, it is nothing short of, of miraculous. To have somebody like Dr. Sheffield on our board, I, I mean, when we start talking about programs, it's one thing to think about what we want, but Superintendent Burke, it's to have your chief academic officer saying, these are the programs we want supported. It, it allows, <clears throat> and I use the term marriage, between the foundation and the school district to be that strong. Uh, everything we do is consonant with your strategic plan. Everything we do is consonant with your, your direction. And everything we do is consonant with your program uh, priorities. And so again, I want to commend you for the people that you've appointed to our board, Superintendent Burke. And, and I definitely want to thank Dr. Sheffield because as we expand our programs, at the end of the day, it's all about the kids. It's not about us. It's about making sure that our students and our teachers have the resources they need. Uh, I've mentioned our team here. I think I've, I've singled them all out at one point. Uh, they are absolutely phenomenal. Again, Frank, you, you've been very kind over the last couple of years uh, in talking about the work we do. But ladies and gentlemen, I brought them here today because they are the ones who make the magic happen. Um, I have a very important job, Marsha. I show up every day, I open the door, I make the coffee, and then I just get the hell out of everyone's way and let them do their jobs. Uh, but they are an incredible team. Uh, as I said, a number of them are former teachers. They have that passion, Barbara, that, that you still have uh, as, as, as an educator, as a principal. Uh, they bring that passion to the work they do every single day, and I think uh, the success speaks for itself. Those concludes my remarks, and at that point, I'll take any questions you have or uh, reflections. So, Chairman Barbieri, back to you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. President. Ms. Brill. Thank you. So I just want to start off by saying, Mr. Gravillis, you are very modest. But I have been on this board for many years, and I will tell you that the transition of this organization has been absolutely amazing. Um, just so proud of all of the work that you do, and all of you. I think that what you do is you foster creativity and commitment from your employees. You make it a fun place to work. Everybody works really hard, but you know the staff, just seeing these people that are so committed, it speaks for itself. And just gonna throw out an idea, that may help you in bringing in some more money is that once that building is built, maybe consider selling the naming rights, putting someone's name on the Red Apple Supplies store. So you might be able to raise some extra money that way. But again, I just want to thank you. I know that um, several superintendents ago, there was some skepticism about the viability of the Education Foundation. You have proven that to be so wrong and everything that you've done, I know that we, we cannot thank you enough, so thank you. Thank you, we appreciate that. I would say when you talk about the naming rights, we're, we're already well into that process. Uh, we're <laughs> gonna be um, sharing some of that good news in the next 60 days. It would be inconceivable uh, to have a building without a couple of local company names, and I won't say anything more until we have that announcement in the next 60 days. Mrs. Whitfield. I just have to take a minute um, to thank you guys. I'm, I, I go to as many events of yours as I can, which is, I think, most of them. And I am uh, always super impressed with the dedication of, of really the entire Education Foundation Board. Um, every one of those members comes into it with a commitment towards education that you can't fake. And so I'm always so impressed to see, you know, the, the people that you bring in from this community and how much dedication they have towards helping education. And you're really facilitating that business partnership with the school district in ways that those of us up here wouldn't be able to do without you. So I'm so grateful that you're able to make that happen. Uh, I honestly cannot believe the $5 million number. I was kind of waiting to hear what it was gonna be. Um, it's just unbelievable what you've done for this community. Um, I'm also very glad to see that your team expands um, over time. So every time you come, it seems a little bit bigger and now we've got, <laughs> we're into the second row. Hopefully one day you're taking up uh, the whole rest of the room. Um, I think it's, it really goes to show where the priorities of this community are, to have you uh, growing as a, as a group, um, and the impact that you're having on our schools um, and our teachers is huge. I'm looking forward to seeing the day where we have 100% participation at our schools. I think when we talk about teachers having to pay out of their pocket for, for school supplies, um, that was something that we always just accepted was a thing that happened, um, but you're actually solving that problem, and so you're really putting money back into the pockets of our teachers, so I'm, I'm 
always impressed. You've done a great job, and I just want to thank you so much sincerely for everyone's work here. You guys are just amazing, and I'm, I'm proud to know you. Thank you. And I appreciate that, and I, I want to say something both to your comment, Erica, and as well to Karen Brill. Um, you know, the Zen concept of the butterfly effect, when a butterfly sneezes on this coast, it's felt on the other. Um, Fifteen years ago, a, a chief financial officer named Mike Burke invited a gentleman named Ed Tanser to be on the budget committee, who then got on the board of the Ed Foundation. And I want you to think about what that decision you made years ago, Mike, has resulted in. Um, these board members you see of our 36 board members, I think a third to half of them were personally recruited by Ed Tanser. Um, as we said, he became a verb in this community. You were Tansered. Uh, when Ed invited you to lunch, you knew that you were either on a board, buying a ticket, or you just bought a table at, a, at an event. Um, he personally hired Teresa Dabrowski. He hired myself, Jennifer, uh, and you just you, you see that effect. You never know what, what one butterfly can do when it moves, and you're seeing it in the growth of the Education Foundation. Mm. Under Mr. Moore's leadership for the last year, you know, we, we set out specifically to create a more diverse board, a board that looks much more like the school district we serve, and you're seeing that uh, as we recruit board members. So everybody makes their mark, and we just move into the future as one team. So I, I appreciate those comments. Mrs. Andrews. I'm truly happy to see you all today. The Education Foundation, you are just so awesome with everything that you do. I can tell you, uh, uh, Mr. Gravillis and, and Mr. Moore, and I see your team sitting right here with you. That means so much to me to see them because I've seen them at work. I've seen all of you at work. When I think about your board, yes, we need money, but your board works. That's what I'm talking about. I see your board driving trucks, lifting boxes, doing the work. I mean, I see them as we go to the Red Apple Supply Store where they're actually helping the teachers fill their bags. I've seen them go out to the Glades region in those trucks to deliver supplies so that teachers and others won't have to drive to the east. I've seen it all, and when I see you, I think about the vision we've had here in Palm Beach County is, is really great. And Mr. Moore, I see you all the time. And I think about you with the Ed Foundation, but I think you belong to me and the school district of Palm Beach County because you just do all kinds of things. You're so versatile. But I love it when you give us the updates every month at the school board meetings so you keep us informed. This beautiful packet and this PowerPoint You've been talking to us and telling us about the great things every single month. The Wi-Fi extenders, all of those people that were out there in the Glades, you just did it in the Lantana area too, and the people who had not had the opportunity to have their own you know, Wi-Fi extender and their own internet capacity. Just thinking about all of that. And I've seen your new uh, staff come on board. And when I see them, I'm looking at them now, but I know them. I know your team. And when you tell me to get on my shorts and, and jeans and my, my tennis shoes and start lifting some boxes, I see all of your board members doing that. So I'm just so thrilled to say that you have taken the Ed Foundation uh, to heights of great greatness here in Palm Beach County and it takes all of us our children know you when they see your new big truck rolls around I saw that big truck and I says there they are the teachers are waiting when you come they know when you're on their schedule to drop off those supplies so they won't ever have to worry about trying to spend the monies out of their pocket to buy supplies for their children all over the district it's a great thing. Meredith Trim, I, can, I just can go on and on, but I know my other board members have to talk. But she came out to Pahokee some years ago with the robotics program, and that program now is above reproach. And when I look at all of the things that you do, I'm just truly happy. I get a chance to sometimes travel around the state and nation and look at other uh, foundations, but we are second to none. We are awesome. And when I see all the money you brought in here because of the people who care about our children, our children and our teachers, when we actually have the award ceremony where they're writing their grants so that they can take care of their children. I'm not gonna take it from all the other board members, but I've got a whole lot I can talk about to say thank you. Thank you, thank you for everything that you do. And you are a key 
stable support mechanism for the school district of Palm Beach County. No one can leave and go to any other foundation or charity. <laughs> you cannot go, you belong to us. And our children, our teachers, our whole Palm Beach County family thanks you so much and uh, we need to celebrate you and we'll have to figure out how to do that quickly to let you know we value you so much. Thank you. Appreciate that, Marcia. Thank you. Ms. Ayala. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So it's just such a pleasure to work with all of you all the time. Um, I've really enjoyed getting to know all of you. And I enjoy that when I come up with the next idea that's going to make your life more difficult. Um, and I call Teresa and I'm like, OK, so I have this donor and he has masks and the Hispanic community wants to get backpacks. How do we make this happen? Within 48 hours, I had the truck. James met me. I think two folks from the back met me, too. And we unloaded at Hope Centennial Elementary with <clears throat> supplies, masks, backpacks stocked full, all because someone wanted to do something nice for the community, and you all helped me put it together. That would not have been possible without you. When I attended our awards, the awards, the wonderful awards ceremony that you put together for our system every single year, and I'm like, how can we do a little more for some of our non-instructional employees? You all work, worked with me, talked me through how we can make something happen, and accepted the creativity to give back, and that's just who you are. So I just want to thank you all so much for who you are, what you do, committing your time. The board is so impressive. These are folks that are executives at high-level jobs with a lot to do, and they choose to give their time to this organization because you are, without a doubt, the best education foundation in the state. Um, I proudly represent you on my plate in the back of my car and give my money towards the education foundation system in the state of Florida. But genuinely, from the bottom of my heart, as a board member, seeing your presence means so much to all of us, means so much to our schools. And I'm just grateful for all of you and all that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mrs. McQuinn, then Mrs. Um, Mrs. Whitfield. Well, I cannot top any of that, clearly. <laughs> but I can tell you that we would all arm wrestle um, I can't remember her name right. This Mrs. Brill, I couldn't do it for her spot. But she always <laughs> takes it every year. But I promise you, we all want it. I love seeing your smiling faces. I love that I recognize all of you. When we come to an event, you're like, there. Let me get you in the right spot. Let me take care of you. And I so appreciate it. I can't repeat, begin to repeat everything that has been said, but I think you know how very much we value you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Quinn. Mrs. Whitfield. I'm sorry, I just have to say this. So <laughs> for like seven years, I've been getting uh, from Mr. Gavrilos about why I had, the, uh, I had to share the road license plate forever. And I finally got to a point where it was time to renew my license plate and the guilt was overtaking me. <laughs> and so I finally said, all right. And I switched my license plate. So like Miss Ayala, I look at my license plate and every time I think of you, James, I think that man finally got to it's me. It's the Greek in the area. Yes. So we're not sharing the road anymore. We're pro-education. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. Greeks have a PhD in guilt. I get it. <laughs> Mrs. Andrews. I've just got to say something else. If you've ever seen 10,000 backpacks given away at a school and the party that it exhibits with the children, it's phenomenal. There was one little kid at Gove uh, last year, and she got her backpack, and she started crying. And she said, no one has ever been this nice to me before to give me all my school supplies and this beautiful pink backpack. And all of the people were just so excited. The children were so excited. To everybody got one. They could pick the color they wanted. Everybody was just thrilled. It's just amazing to come to an event like that. It makes your day and your year. And all of the dancers, uh, Mr. Moore and all of your directors, they know how to give a party for backpacks. <laughs> and the children can't wait. Every grade level comes through there and get a new backpack. And everybody's so happy when they go. And it lasts them throughout the year. Their parents don't have to worry about spending money going to the store to buy them their school supplies. They have enough to last them for the year. So I'm so emotional because I've been with you and I see it. And when you see it and, you, and you're so thankful because you see the hearts of the children and the teachers every time you show up, it's big. It's yeah. huge. Thank you. 
I appreciate that. And, and I just want to go back to the slide where we're going. Um, we actually do a strategic plan, uh, Mr. Chairman, every year. We take a day as a staff and we go away and we plan out our, our goal for the year. And I've said to the staff, if we don't fulfill, you know, most charities have one that sits in a desk somewhere gathering dust. I said, if we don't fulfill 75 to 80 percent of the tactical initiatives, I would say to the board chairman, fire me. Fire me and get somebody in here who will do the job right. Um, and we do that every year. We fulfill 75 to 80 percent of the tactical initiatives in our strategic plan. And one of the things um, that we've talked about last year and as we look at next year is really taking the lead on the conversation. Dr. Robinson, you and I have been talking for years about internships, uh, making sure that our young people, especially in some of our harder hit economic neighborhoods, have access to internships, to get something on their resume, to get some experience now when they apply for a job. And these are the types of things that we want to start doing moving forward. We want to lead the discussion, as Jennifer has led with uh, the Behavioral Health Technician Program, as we're looking at a, quite honestly, a logistics academy, uh, a, a career academy for logistics and warehouse support. I mean, that's the future right now. That's, that's the future job growth in America. So you know, we're doing those things. But again, I, I just want to close uh, with this, Chairman Barbieri. I hope um, this we've presented for two uh, fiscal years. Uh, I believe the value we brought to the district, but it starts with leadership. It starts with leadership on this side of the table. Uh, Jim Moore from United Healthcare and so many of the board members uh, that we've been referring to, Office Depot. Uh, Marsha, you're talking about the Start Proud initiative. Um, in a couple of weeks, teaser, um, we're going to be announcing the schools that Office Depot is going to be serving this year. Uh, we have some great corporate partners um, that, that help us do our work, but it also starts with your leadership. And I have to commend the seven of you. Uh, you couldn't pay me enough to sit in your chair and, and, yep. and listen to the abuse you take on an almost monthly basis. Um, I, I, there, there are meetings I sit here and I just, what sane person would do what you do? Um, and the simple fact is you do it because you love the children and you love our teachers and you love the educational system in Palm Beach County and your leadership has been exemplary. Marsha, you talked about the Start Proud initiative with our partners at Office Depot and I'm going to close. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not cite the leadership of your superintendent, Mike Burke. Um, I said to you a year ago about this time, I'd follow this man into battle. Uh, it was, you know, when I watched him at, at those elementary schools at Start Proud, and he didn't make a cursory <laughs> appearance and show up and take a uh, photo op and then go off and do something else, Superintendent Burke sat there for an hour and a half passing out backpacks, talking to the young people, engaging with the young people. Um, you, as board members, did an outstanding job in selecting him as superintendent, and he, as superintendent, leads this, su this district with passion, with intelligence, with vision, with strategy, but above all, with heart. And when you lead with heart, you can accomplish miracles. And so the leadership from your side of the table, the leadership from our side of the table results in what we think is a very effective partnership. And we thank you for your continued support. And uh, I'm just going to do one back towards you guys because <clears throat> as part of the business community, you know, you don't hear from us that often. You know, I'd like to say we're the silent majority. And we can't do, we can't get the businesses involved without you being very strong and having a very good direction. And, and everyone I talk to when I go to events in the business community just is amazed at what you guys have put up with for the past couple years here, and thank you all. So on behalf of myself and, and the rest of the business community, thank you for, for focusing on the teachers and the kids, because uh, that's what's really important. So thank you all for that, because without you doing that, we can't get the business support. Well, I just um, want to end with my comments. Uh, you know, every, every month, um, President Gavrilos comes to our board meetings, <clears throat> and of course, I call his name, they bring him up, and then I get to thank him on behalf of the board, and usually <clears throat> they don't have an opportunity to, to show their appreciation, and we are, you know, we're thrilled and we're so grateful for everything you do, and I'm glad that we had this workshop today so that you could hear from my colleagues. I mean, we unanimously, you know, think that you are the greatest gift that we've gotten in years. And uh, I think Karen said it, uh, uh, James, you, um, I mean, you've changed, changed everything since you've been here. I mean, it's, you've got a great team, you know, and, and I get to see them often and thank them. And we all get to see them individually and thank them. Uh, but we don't have the opportunity to thank you all as a group. And, uh, and, and uh, you've, you've just done an amazing job. We're so fortunate, as some of the board members said, to have you here in our county when, you know, there's 66 other counties that you could have set up shop in. And, and 
you chose to do it with us. And so we uh, very much appreciate everything you've done for our, for, our, for our schools, for our teachers, for our principals, and most importantly, for what you do for our children. So thank you all very, very much for everything that you do every single day of the week to help, help us do our jobs here. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. See you next year. <laughs> See you next month. <laughs> okay, our budget, budget workshop's up next, and this includes both the general fund operating budget and our capital projects budget. So you get the whole team, Ms. Heather Frederick, CFO, Mr. Joe Sanchez, COO, and Ms. Leanne Evans, Treasurer. And Mr. Dave Dolan, Facilities Management. Good evening, everybody. I, I know that um, it's been a long day for all of you, and so I, I will go. Uh, some of these slides are very familiar to you, so I'm not going to go in as much detail as I have in the past, but if please stop me if, as we're going through, uh, if you'd like me to take some more time. This is our third uh, budget workshop uh, of the year, and it's our final one prior to tentative adoption, which is on August 3rd. We will be having another uh, capital budget workshop um, sometime in August, so you will be able to get a little more information at that time. We've also had three uh, meetings with the Budget Advisory Committee, and um, we've had some recent information come out from the state. Uh, we had our fourth calculation that was released on May 24th, and we had our property values, certified property values, which were released last Friday. So that's a little teaser of, of some um, good news that we're, we're going to get on our property valuations. Our general fund budget is balanced, um, so I'm happy to report that. The capital budget is also balanced. And then we also have our special revenue fund, uh, which the significant part of special revenue fund uh, still continues to be those ESSER, ESSER funds. Uh, we are, and then I'm also going to go over some challenges um, that we continue to face, just monitoring our ESSER dollars because we know that funding is gonna end June 30th, and just the overall challenges uh, with enrollment and uh, making sure that, that we really focus on getting our enro enrollment to rebound. So we're gonna start with the financial condition ratio. Uh, we did receive updated information from the state which shows uh, now the FY21 information for all um, urban seven districts. And you can see that our financial condition ratio uh, did jump up. We're the orange line there uh, from 9% to 12%, which was very consistent with what happened during the Great Recession. So we were at 11.41%. But you can see that's pretty consistent with all the districts. They had a jump um, as a result of those federal funds that we received. Uh, our amount of 12% is also consistent with the statewide average, which is 11.98%. Uh, so we're gonna see, like we did during the Great Recession, an increase, it will level off, and then we'll start to see a decline. Um, but we wanna be very strategic of using those one-time funds uh, for non-recurring type expenditures. We also received updated information from the National Education Association, which, uh, compares uh, nationally um, teacher pay and the amount we spend on uh, education. Uh, so looking at our per student funding in FY21, we did go up slightly, so we're now number 44 in the nation. And that per student spending of $10,000, $10,700 is higher than what you normally see because it includes all funding sources. So it includes capital as well as special revenue. And then I also wanted to point out our average starting teacher salary as well as our average teacher salary. So you know that we had an initiative in our state to increase the, at the starting teacher salary to 47,500. And by doing that, you can see we jumped up considerably to number 16 in the nation when it comes to starting teacher salary. But when you look at average teacher salary, we're still number 48. So it still shows that we have um, some room um, to uh, increase that funding in for those uh, more senior um, teachers. And when we get into uh, the funding this year um, in the FVFP, uh, we are, they, the state did give us the flexibility in using that, those funds for 
more t uh, tenured and senior teachers, uh, but we still have to make sure that we're complying with statute, so we are still limited. But when you look at the statewide average teacher salary of $51,000, and then you compare that to our average salary here in Palm Beach County, we're at 56,100, and that's after including the raise that we gave for this year in FY22. And if you include the referendum, we're at $63,150. Um, so that, that proves the investment that the board has made in you know, putting our money into you know, those um, that are most valuable to the district. Our general fund budget is going to be uh, two point, almost $2.5 billion. And do know that you know, we, we are going through tentative adoption is on August 3rd, final adoption is on September 7th, so we will see some changes in between now and tentative adoption, as well as also between tentative and final adoption. Um, schools continues to be the largest component of our district budget, uh, and this is a chart that you've seen in the past, but the one uh, piece of the pie that's new is uh, the schools, McKay and FES, a piece of the pie, which is th it represents now 3% of our district budget. That's the amount um, that is going, th it's not actually passing through the district, uh, but it is included in our total FEFP funding, and it's, it's paid directly from um, the Florida Department of Education uh, to whichever schools those students are attending. Um, charter schools at, are at 8%, and the referendum comprises 10% of our district budget. And this is the chart that um, you have seen in the past. It's an overview of our FEF, FEFP funding for uh, FY23. Um, I did update this with the fourth calculation that came out on May 24th. So it is a little different than the numbers we had reported previously, um, but it's just because the, now the comparison, instead of being to the third calculation, it's now compared to the fourth calculation. Uh, so our increase in um, students is 3,600. Uh, but that's district-wide, so that includes district-operated schools, uh, charter schools, as well as FES and McKay. So the increase in students that we're looking at and projecting right now is about, in district-operated schools, is 360 out of that 3,600. But we are hopeful that we'll see more of an increase in our students, you know, closer to 1,500 or 2,000. But what we've currently budgeted for is, is an increase of 350. Um, you can see that increase in the, the base student allocation of the $230. That increase in the base student allocation is to fund um, the increase in the minimum wage to um, $15 per hour, um, as well as um, the increase in the FRS, uh, which is a 1% increase in the FRS, which represents to us, to the school district of Palm Beach County, $10 million. You can also see the Florida um, Row 20, the Florida Classroom Teachers Compensation. Uh, there was an increase of uh, $16.6 .6 million in our district, which in also includes the, the share to charter schools, and that's dedicated to uh, teachers. And since we're already at that 47500 we have some more flexibility as how, on how those funds can be um, allocated and distributed. And then when we get to row 31, um, the Palm Beach County tax roll, at the time that we prepared the presentation, we didn't have the certified values. So the increase was, we were looking at was 7.42% was the projected increase in the, the county tax roll. Those numbers came in on Friday and they actually came in at 18%. Um, so that is uh, much higher than, than I've seen previously. I know in speaking with Ms. Evans, you know, she's seen 23%, so it's not the highest. Um, so we are looking, we are going to be receiving some additional revenue um, related to the discretionary uh, millage as well as the referendum. Um, so our net district funding, uh, increase in funding that we're due to uh, see is $49.4 million. And, but we have to take into consideration that, like I mentioned, the increase in the Florida retirement system. We have to increase our, our um, contingency to remain in compliance with the, the board policy. We also have an increase in our electricity. We have to also add additional staffing for our increase in enrollment. Uh, we have to set aside funds for the annualized salary settlements um, that we settled that were effective as of January 1st. We need to recognize the full year in FY23. 
And we have to set aside the funds uh, for the teacher uh, compensation categorical with the district of, uh, portion is 14.7 million and also the amount to comply with increasing the minimum hourly rate to $15 per hour. Um, so with that, the budget, like I said, we had a, a slight uh, a deficit of $800,000, but with that increase in the property taxes, uh, we are going to end up having a, a surplus. I wanted to go over the department changes. Uh, what we do is with all of our, our departments, um, the last several years, we have each of the department heads uh, present in front of the superintendent. So we do a detailed line item review annually. Uh, so we are looking at an, an increase of uh, $3.3 million within the general fund um, in the departments. Uh, within the capital projects, as well as the capital maintenance transfer uh, fund, it's a total of $4.9 million. And with our internal service fund, it's uh, $230,000. And we're looking to add um, 28 FTE, or 28 uh, positions. And starting with uh, the uh, governance area, we have the general counsel to the board. So the general counsel um, will be adding back the deputy general counsel position, um, as well as some additional software um, that they need. Um, the inspector general will be adding a uh, coordinator uh, complaint intake uh, position in order to help coordinate um, all of the um, uh, the claims that are not the claims, but um, the reports that are that come in from the different areas, and because they they coordinate sending it out to different departments within the district, so this position will help to coordinate that function. So that's within the governance area, uh, within the chief of staff, just adding some additional funds for in county travel because we did make significant reductions previously with um, travel and in county travel in particular, um, so adding additional in county travel. Uh, in the chief academic office uh, uh, division, uh, adding a director of athletics, as well as um, some additional um, non-salary and um, additional software costs, and um, expanding, and we're adding back the showcase of schools, which is something that was eliminated during COVID. Uh, within uh, my division, uh, we have an increase in the armored car service, you know, the cost that we have to pay. It's difficult for them to hire. It's difficult to even, you know, to get them to, to have the staff to be able to pick up at our school sites. Um, so we, there is a planned increase for that. Uh, we also have some uh, routine increases in our insurance premiums and our refresh of our time clocks uh, that we have. And then within our internal service fund, uh, with the uh, increase in claims uh, and activity within our health fund, um, adding some additional support um, to help monitoring the activity within um, our health fund. Uh, with the chief information officer, um, an increase, and this is all capital related and it's all related to just software renewals of $2.7 million. And with the division of the chief operating officer, uh, we're looking to add back and expand uh, the custodial rovers. Um, that's been, uh, filling the custodial positions has been a challenge. And, um, and those that are out, we need to make sure that we have appropriate coverage. Uh, we did try to utilize temps, temp agencies, and they had difficulty hiring and filling those, uh, that need. Uh, so we want to look, uh, we want to get back to having our own pool of custodians. Um, then just uh, also with uh, transportation, um, assisting um, on the transportation side, adding some contracted uh, transportation to help with some of the, the ESE routes. And now I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Evans and, and Mr. Sanchez will be going over the capital budget. Good, good afternoon, everyone. It's good to be in front of you again and go through the capital budget. As um, Ms. Frederick mentioned, the capital budget is basically balanced uh, for FY23. But I want to start off with just a quick update on sales tax because that's such a big component of our budget. Um, these numbers were receipts through April. And we were at 118% of projections, um, roughly 57% of project receipts. I can tell you with the May numbers that came in, which came in after this presentation was filed, we're up to 120% of projections. So I think I mentioned at an earlier meeting that if you ask me to project, um, we probably will be ending the sun, will sunset the sales tax a year early. 
Um, lots can happen between now and then. Um, we've learned that, not, if nothing else, we've learned that in the past couple of years. Um, but look, it looks like it's coming in well ahead of projections. And the expenditures, 490 million. Purchase orders are at 108 million. Um, interest earnings and the line of credit are there. Um, it's working very well. So the, the update, the challenge that we've got is the construction costs have been increasing pretty substantially. You're starting to see agenda items come through where we're adding money into budgets. We um, gave a presentation to the Sales Tax Oversight Committee a week or two ago and went over this. We'd been asked, how are we going to manage these increasing costs? What are we going to do? Because the budgets for the sales tax were set. So we have a couple of things in mind that we're doing. Um, first of all, just looking at available revenues. We have money in the sales tax reserve. That was built in the sales tax from the very beginning. So that money is still there. We've had some interest earnings. And we have a projection that 120, 20, 122 million is what I'm projecting if the sales tax ends early. The sunset provision states that we have to have collected 1.35 billion by September 1st. That would be earned as of June 30th in order to close in sunset. At that point, we still have six months of revenue to come in. So this is the projection of the extra money we would have in sales tax revenue. Then what we do, we're doing, we're switching some funding for some projects. Um, we're taking the facility renewals for Lake Worth High School, Olympic Heights, Santa Lucia's, and Dwyer, and moving them into the upcoming COPS issue that you'll see on your agenda for June 15th. So we're switching that to COPS to borrowing, which frees up the sales tax money to help deal with all the cost overruns. We'll also be um, switching the funding for Riviera Beach Prep. Um, that scope change is going to be discussed in the next couple of slides. Um, blending it in with North Tech, so I don't want to get ahead of that, but that's another thing. It does, it's not the same scope we had for the sales tax, so we'll switch that to borrowing and free up the sales tax dollars. So net altogether, it's $275 million that is available for cost overruns. Um, the AECOM, our program manager, has estimated about $190 million in, co in cost overruns in these projects, and cost overruns is the wrong term. Cost escalation due to rising costs, supply chain issues, labor costs. Um, that's spread across a lot of projects, but it adds up very quickly. And then we also have an estimate for some of the construction projects, and these are estimates at this point. So we have 222 million of expected rising cost and 275 million of revenue options. There's a lot of estimates there. So that is just a strategic plan that we're walking through and we'll continue to monitor as we go through. And every time you see an agenda item where the cost has gone up, we're tracking that back and also tracking all the revenues. So um, this is just a plan of what we're doing because we don't want people to think we will not be able to finish the work that we promised to do. Ms. Evans, let me ask you a question. On the funding, changing the funding for those four high schools in Riviera Beach Prep, um, is that going to cause any delay in getting those projects done? No, no, not at all. Some of the contracts had already been awarded, um, and you'll see this in, at the next board meeting um, with the COPS issue, we bring in so what's called a reimbursement agreement in advance that gives us permission to go ahead and start spending the, the debt proceeds before we actually borrow. So we try to be very careful in how we do that, but these contracts were awarded February, March, and April. They're just getting started. So we'll just move the expenses that have been incurred so far into the debt issue once it's done. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions on this? I'm gonna jump right into the capital plan. Mrs. Whitfield. I think you've talked about this a little bit, but I, I would just like to clarify it. Um, one of the concerns I've heard in the community is that we are pushing um, these expenses when we're doing construction back onto the contractors and not helping to mitigate with that. Um, but I believe that what we've been doing internally here is is trying to deal, if they've given us a, a quote and the costs have gone so much higher, we've actually been working to mitigate that. Can you can you talk to that a little bit, or is that maybe Mr. Sanchez's conversation? Sure. Um, so you know, that's uh, typically called escalation, um, and so we we have a we have negotiated new terms in our contract to allow us to uh, consider when escalation exceeds a certain dollar amount or a certain percentage, I should say, and um, we will we'll ask the contractor for a proof of that, so they have to go back and get competitive numbers if possible and to prove that it's not just them coming up with the number, it's actually the supplier that's coming up with that number. So we'll, we'll negotiate that and we'll estimate, do I want to cost that estimate as well to make sure it's, it's verifiable. And when it makes sense, we'll bring that back to the board, to, and both to Cork and to the board to make sure that it's a reasonable amount. So we, we try to um, manage the risk and share the risk as best as possible, but we want to make sure that we're being fair to our contractors without being overly burdensome as well. 
Thank you. I feel like that's really important that we share with the community that we are, are being a good partner. Thank you. Okay, so the FY23 capital budget, as I mentioned, it's balanced. Um, every year I tell you it will change between now and tentative and then final adoption. As we close out projects, we report interest earnings, um, final revenue that have come in. Um, there will be changes, but this is a really good, solid draft, and I'm comfortable that it's balanced. We are still working on the capital plan. We're still reviewing that. Um, we do have the increased taxable value that has to be blended in. So we bring the capital budget, the whole capital plan, the 10 year plan back to most likely in August at a workshop. All the departments have reviewed and updated the projections. We start every year with the last year's capital plan that you approved in September and each department that works on these projects goes through and tells me what needs to be changed. And that's how we develop the new plan every year. Sometimes we're just increasing budgets or decreasing budgets, sometimes adding new things in. So some of the additions this year is the hard panic solution for all sites. That's coming to the board in a couple of weeks as well. It's a security measure. Um, the North Tech River Beach Prep, and we'll be talking about that on the next slide, as well as an addition um, of a South Intensive Renovation Project at South Tech. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the modernization of West Transportation, I've heard that's come up in many workshops with the board. That's been added in. The media center upgrades. Um, Acceleration of the BEMP, and that's building envelope maintenance. So that's painting, waterproofing, sealing, everything on the exterior of the building. We've expedited all those into either FY22, if possible, or FY23. So those projects are all being scheduled, um, adding in digital marquees for all the high schools and guard shacks for the high schools. And with this, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Sanchez to talk a little bit. Thank you. Again, Joseph Sanchez, Chief Operating Officer. So I just want to talk about a couple of the, the big projects. Um, Mr. Sanchez, one. I just want to yep. say thank you for finally hearing me with the modernization of West Transportation. Now we have covered every last facility. That's a big deal. And I've heard from many of my constituents uh, about the guard shacks. Yeah. And so we need to publicize that a little bit because people are talking about safety and one-way entry within the schools and certainly the digital marquee uh, situation. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Burke, for stepping on it with uh, Royal Palm Beach High School because our marquees are in bad shape. So mm -hmm. this list is so profound. So thank you so very much. Absolutely. We want to make sure we have equity in schools. We, we know some schools, some communities can afford to buy their own. And we're trying to get that equity amongst all of our schools. And for the, the, the guard shacks at the high schools specifically, you know, we have single point of entries for all of our schools. So once you get onto the campus, you can't get beyond the front entrance. Um, but on the high schools, those are big campuses, right? So if you get onto the, if you get into the parking lot, um, we want to make sure there's, you can't get into the parking lot and go someplace else around the, the main point of entry. So um, we think that's a, a vital point. So we're going to be doing that with all of our high schools. Some of them will have it, all of them will have it very shortly. All right, some of the major projects, and we talked about these a little bit before. Um, so North Tech, River Beach Prep, which is going to be a combined campus over there in Garden Road. Um, right now, we're in the process just, just uh, finalizing uh, what the program's going to be. That's going to be a, about a $40 million project. Um, it's going to be a combination of some renovations and new construction as well. Um, so that's going to incorporate a lot of different programs and bring in students, high school students from uh, it's going to have its own high school students as well as having high school students coming, students coming from the North region as well as uh, adult students will be able to, um, to receive education at that campus or continue to receive education at that campus. They, they currently do now. Um, the, so that's about a $40 million project, as I mentioned. Um, North, uh, Inlet Grove, um, we're looking at a facility renewal project there on the old Suncoast campus. Um, right now we're looking at a $30 million project there. And again, that, that would be um, looks like looking at some renovations there. Uh, to make that campus, uh, renew that campus that was built in 1950. So we're looking to, to get some work done there. We're still working with the school on um, refining the program to make sure we can get a, a project done within the budget that's, uh, that the board is making available to them. And then South Intensive, we heard you at the last workshop that you wanted to make sure that that's a campus that's um, indicative or, or representative of what we should be doing for those, those students at that school. So what we did was we looked at um, the existing South Tech campus, um, and we identified building two as the most viable building to save there. So instead of having those students in portable campus, portable buildings, we're going to move them into um, building two um, after we renovate it and be able to eliminate the, the portables there. 
Um, so that's that's going to be a much improved facility for them, and they also have some some um, access to some career academy type programs there, so those students will uh, be able to to gain some skills, so they can they can take that on uh, to future careers as well. Any questions on that? Dr. Robinson. I knew someone was coming. <laughs> See, I wasn't going to ask a question, um, okay. but just to make a comment, I, you know, this might be the, my favorite PowerPoint slide <laughs> in decades. Okay. Right? No, seriously. Job, like, man. as long as I have been job. begging, right, we put the program, the Riviera Beach program, Riviera Beach prep program was originally at Historic Roosevelt. We moved it to that campus so that those students would be able to take advantage of the automotive and other um, career academy kind of programs that the facility allowed. And that never really came to fruition, right? And, and so now to see that, you know, like this brand spanking new combined with Riviera Beach Prep, like, is just good. And finally, I'm tired of talking about Inlet Grove. Can we, like, yes, let's, let's move it. And then the word nimble comes to mind. So I have been so frustrated for a long time because, and I won't go into too many details, but I mean, I have heard no in so many different ways, like nicely and gently, but no, and passive aggressively, but no. But it was just like, no. And when I talked about South Intensive to you, Mr. Sanchez, you said we should look at that. And now it's here. And I'm just, I'm thankful, I'm thankful to, Everybody who has to sign off on this, I'm just saying, <laughs> this is like, finally? Okay, so I'll, I'll bring it back in check now, but ooh, thank you. Mrs. McGuinn. I'm not going to get into any kind of uh, um, troublesome remarks right now. I know Leanne was looking at me and Mr. Sanchez. Okay, so first of all, let me say something regarding um, Rivera Beach Prep. I'm very excited about Riviera Beach Prep uh, co-locating with um, North Technical Education Center students, both adults and high school. However, and I do have a, a meeting tomorrow, program committee with Dr. Sheffield, uh, to, to move on to the program piece because, as Mr. Sanchez says, we can't build something unless we know what something is going to be taught at the school. So, Riviera Beach Prep kids are high school kids. It is not an alternative ed center, so I want to correct something that was said earlier in a meeting. Um, it is, it, it's, a, it's a school for students who are behind in their credits for any number of reasons. I would have been a great Riviera Beach prep candidate. And the kids are doing so beautifully. We have Families First Therapists co-located there who, even when the school district is not helping fund them, they stay with the kids through the summer to make sure that we don't lose them. And um, I will tell you, we didn't lose any Riviera Beach prep kids. We know that, that some left, but we know where they are. So we don't have any kids unaccounted for from Riviera Beach Prep. That having been said, right now, Riviera Beach Prep kids who are high school kids do not go to school during the school day from let's say eight to three with adults. And I'm gonna have a hard time being convinced that we are going to have adults matriculating with our high school kids during the school day. We did not do that back in the old days when I was a teacher at Gardens High. Students who went to North Tech programs did their academics at their home schools. They had lunch and then they went to their career programs at North Tech. And I'm just going to say here now, without getting into it, and I know I'm creating a bit of a battle, if not a war, I don't see our high school students matriculating 
with adults. Those programs can start at 3 o'clock because these are not kids who are going, if they're going to do athletics and activities, they're going to do them back at their home schools. And I'll let that go for now. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the program person, so I just, I just build the spaces. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought that was I'm the sorry, a follow-up, please, by day Mr. It was Chair. High school adult. I truly do yeah. thank all of you. Yeah. Thank you so very much because it has taken a long time to agree. And I want, and Ms. Andrews will acknowledge, I have been so very, very supportive since my first day on the board of West Tech because that is a priority and it should have happened. And I don't think anyone said we had 12 CDL certificate, cert, that, however you say that, drivers um, out of West Tech this year. So that's very incredible. Okay, so, um, but I, really, I so thank you. And again, in concept, it had been agreed to, but never funded until we had Joe and Leanne and Heather, all working together to make it happen. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I so totally forgot. <laughs> and you know that I will thank you especially. <laughs> he was smiling at me nicely through that, too. <laughs> I think it's fair to say we're reunited, and it feels so good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> okay, so next slide. <laughs> so um, the TDR, the Transferable Development Rights, um, this is all connected with uh, Drive for School of the Arts. Um, so once we get the money approved, that money's going to go into the capital budget. Right now we're estimating that to be somewhere north of $8 million. Um, the deal is still moving forward with the city of West Palm Beach. Um, so we're recommending that half of the money uh, go to Dreyfus and the various improvements that need to be made at that school, and the other half go to uh, various historic properties such as uh, North Borough. We have an, an older building up there in the city of West Palm Beach that we committed to renovating, um, but we haven't done so in years. And then uh, Jupiter Elementary School has the old um, auditorium building that we can contribute something to as well. So we have a couple of other historic buildings, but those are the at least two of the ones that we've identified that we want to make some investment in. And then uh, we did receive a grant from uh, Roosevelt, for Roosevelt Full Service from the state, right? Yeah. From the state. And um, that money is going to be used towards the design of um, historic Roosevelt High School. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so a couple other things that we're that we just wanted to point out on the construction projects. So the budget for FY23 is $446.5 million. Um, as, as was mentioned before, a couple of times it is balanced. Uh, we have moved the, shifted a couple of projects around Forest Hill High School. Um, we are looking at um, connecting that with the boundary change that's going to be associated with the new uh, high school that we're building on Lions Road. So that's going to help relieve um, some of the need for addition there. Um, but we're not taking the money out the project yet because we haven't gone through the boundary pro uh, process yet. So we're leaving that money there just in case. And for the parking lot, we're um, we're hopeful that we can work out something with the city of West Palm Beach to to make some significant improvements to the traffic uh, in that area, which may incorporate um, the money that we've allocated for the parking lot. So we're, gonna, we're holding on to that money as well. Uh, we already talked about uh, North Tech and River Beach Prep um, and South Intensive as well as well as uh, the Transportation West. So all those, those new ones that you see on, on the slide were already covered as well. So um, I'll turn it back over to Leanne. Mr. Sanchez, oh, um, no. on the um, addition and remodeling projects, is it's core additions at eight elementary schools. Is Coral Sunset one of those eight? I don't think you remember. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, Coral Sunset is one. I don't know exactly which, which year it is. All right, and everything that was planned for Coral Sunset is moving forward? We're, we're you, not deleting any scope of work, yeah, that's the question you're asking. So every, everything that we promised in the referendum, we're doing. So yes. promises made, promises kept is what we're doing. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, the next slide um, has my favorite chart. We can't get through a capital presentation without me bringing up the debt service slide. 
This will look different when we factor in the increased property values. Um, the lines will shift. And I, I saw the hand go up right after I started. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ms. Evans. Okay. Mrs. Andrews? It's all good. I just <laughs> want to tell you, and especially Dave and, and Joe Sanchez, Leanne, and everybody, you're doing a great job at West Tech. If you haven't driven by recently, it's a beautiful sight to see that building that sat there for 11 years not being used and now up to, up to par and standards with modernization, paint, everything. I mean, when you just walk around, all of the new parking and paving that's happened, uh, the new signage, just the building itself, it's a beautiful sight. I just want to tell you all thank you. You moved quickly to get that done. The community is happy. As you heard today, the graduation for CDL was happened last Friday. All of these people are just so excited and proud to walk up to West Technical Education Center. And thank you for your work. So I couldn't let that go by without telling you it's a beautiful sight. So if you're traveling on 715, just take a look and come on in. You're welcome. OK, so the debt service budget, if you look at last year, you will see it's increased because we brought in those four facility renewals and they're being amortized over a shorter period of time. So the debt service charts look a little different. They'll look different again in final adoption once we update it for the taxable value changes. Other facility projects, this includes the facility renewals. Um, other facility projects is everything from basic maintenance to replacing air conditioners and roofs. Um, the guard shacks are in there. All the other work that we've talked about is listed in there. And site acquisition, um, there's, there's no change there, but that's included in that $642 million. And again, these numbers are just for FY23. We have uh, money in the budget for security projects, um, school buses, trans support vehicles, equipment, and equi the regular equipment. Some of the changes here I wanted to point out, we've, we added musical instruments in a couple of years ago. We've added in money to um, do a regular update of the school TV studios. That was never included in the budget, so I've been working with the TV station, and they're coming up with estimates, and we're going to be going through the schools and updating their equipment. Some of them had really old computers, and so that's now in the capital budget. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. How close are we to every elementary student having the opportunity to play a musical instrument? Every school receives money every year, and the school determines how they're using them. Some of the schools buy instruments. A lot of the schools are buying um, sound system equipment for their courses. So we, we typically let each school decide how they're using that money. That's the way we've been doing it. So can we get um, a report on, on that? I mean, I think all students should be able to learn to play a musical instrument in elementary school. I was hoping we would use some of those federal dollars, those one-time dollars for this one-time expense. Yeah, I mean, as we're, you know, we're working on a strategic plan and we want to do more to inspire students and uh, that, that's going to fit into the plan somewhere. I know Ms. Fredericks looked at some budget things. We, we have a fabulous staff member now, Mr. Cleve Maloon, that's leading up the arts. Yeah. And, uh, we're going to work with him and kick around some ideas. Okay, education technology and technology, both of those, we've had some increases for FY23. And we work with each division to figure out exactly what they need in each given year. Um, with technology in specific, we've added additional Chromebooks that will be going to every school to deal with what do the students use when their computer's broken. So there, there's going to be some extra um, computers available for the students to deal with what they do when their computer's broken. Um, and a lot of things in technology, you'll see a lot of shifts when Ms. Frederick mentioned increases to their department budget and the gen and capital, that's the maintenance transfer. More and more of the things they're buying are in the cloud, which has to move from regular capital down to the maintenance transfer, which flows to the general fund. So we're seeing some shifts um, within the technology area as well. Other capital items, um, property and flood insurance, uh, the reserves and charter schools. The reserves, that includes that money for the, in the um, sales tax. So that looks like a large amount of money, but it very well be needed, may be needed with the cost increases. So when I saw the number, I said, wow, that's really big, but it needs to be um, just because of the cost escalation we're experiencing in construction right now. 
and charter schools um, that was funded by the state this year. We have it in the capital plan um, every year, assuming that we may have to pick it up because state statute says we may have to pick it up. We need to learn year by year if the state's paying for it. So they, they are paying for it in FY23. So as I mentioned earlier, the capital, the whole capital plan through FY32 is still under development and we'll be bringing that back to you um, in August. And the concerns that we have, this, this hasn't really changed, the legislative issues, we're always looking at cost per student station, DOE approvals, um, funding for charter schools, or there's all kinds of things that can happen in Tallahassee that can impact the budget. Um, additional needs for maintenance, you know, getting staffing is really difficult and costs are rising because of that. And of course, rising construction costs. We've already beat that to death today. With that, I'll hand it back over to Ms. Fredericks. Okay, and looking at our special revenue fund budget, um, it's estimate, estimated to be about $385 million. Um, nearly 50% of that is ESSER funds. And this will, the special revenue fund will continue to grow throughout the year as grant awards are received. Uh, there is a requirement under ESSER um, that we um, talk about the award, talk about how we're spending the funds, and we give the opportunity of the public um, to know how to reach out and to provide feedback as to how those funds are, are being utilized. Uh, so in looking at FY23, we're, we're projected to spend about $164 million. Uh, we've already fully spent our ESSER 1 funds. Those were fully spent um, through at the end of FY21. ESSER 2, uh, we're projected to have that fully spent by um, FY, the end of FY22. Uh, we have talked um, in, in numer numerous previous meetings how we're spending the funds. Uh, you know, our board, our, our board priorities have been the safe operation of schools, so it's over $200 million, and that includes uh, the employee um, emergency disaster um, uh, bonuses. Uh, our unfinished learning initiatives, uh, which includes the 24-7 tutoring, and also the nearly 370 positions that we have allocated at the school sites. Um, social, emotional, and mental health needs, um, which include um, additional positions to help um, not only find those missing students, which all have been um, uh, located, and we've made contact with all of them, but also the re-engagement of those students, not only those students, but all students, making sure that they stay engaged in school. Um, technology initiatives, uh, that's $12 million. That was a requirement from um, the state that there was a, a certain amount set aside for technology. Um, and then the, the amount that we're passing through to charter schools as well as the indirect cost. Uh, so we are able to receive uh, public comment at the, uh, at the monthly board meetings. So we really haven't had any feedback through uh, the, the format of the uh, monthly board meetings. Um, there's also the emails uh, to directly to the board office as well as a dedicated email um, that we created that's the uh, ARP feedback at palmbeachschools.org and we haven't received any feedback um, through that um, at this point. We have received some public requests um, but not as to um, ideas of how to spend the funds, just asking for clarification on how those funds are being um, spent. So I just want to give a, a brief uh, uh, recap, our FY22 fund balance um, for as we're going to work on closing out FY22 and we do expect the fund balance to be the be flat. It might even increase a little bit uh, as a result of categoricals and us having to carry over some categoricals like APIB, those things that are specific that we have to carry over to the schools um, and uh, through as required through Florida statute. And then in looking at FY23, um, both the general fund and the capital projects fund are already balanced, uh, but we need to make sure that we continue to monitor enrollment. And that's something that we'll have to, to make sure that, you know, we are projecting an increase of 360 students. Uh, we are, um, that's what we budgeted for in terms of staffing. We are hoping to see more of a growth. Um, but if we do start to see a decline, we have to make sure to make adjustments in order to, to maintain fiscal um, sustainability. And so we're not only in 23, but also 24, making sure to monitor our enrollment increases in FRS. They've been significant the last few years. We expect them to continue to be over the next two in order to get back to that recommended um, amount that the actuary um, is proposing. 
Um, our health claims, we need to continue to monitor our health claims. Uh, we are working with our unions um, uh, to be proactive um, um, to try to get those health claims back down um, after we saw that surge with COVID. Uh, we have the, the renewal of our the annual operating millage and that makes comprises 10% of the district budget. Um, and uh, we are also looking at the local government infrastructure, the penny sales tax, um, as well in the future. And the funding cliff for ESSER is June 30th of 20, um, the funding cliff of, uh, of ESSER is uh, June 30th of 2024. Caught me off guard because it's, you can almost, I can't believe that we're already to that point yet. <laughs> And I just want to remind the board uh, that our tentative budget adoption is August 3rd. The board will be approving the advertisements uh, for that budget adoption on July 20th. And uh, final budget adoption will be September 7th. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. I just want to ask you a quick question since we are talking about this and I just saw it in the um, in this slide. Um, I'm very excited about the fact that we got the school food service um, uh, ability to have free breakfast, lunch, and supper programs. That's just awesome. And, and everything I've ever dreamed of is that we give everyone food when they come to school. Um, but uh, I know there's a potential impact to um, our ability to um, have the paperwork necessary to get through uh, some of our grants. And so I'm wondering, is that going to have an impact on the on the budget at all? Have you? I know you guys have discussed this in detail, but um, I don't fully understand that. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I do. Okay. I mean, so our district is going to um, apply for community eligibility program, which will allow us to continue free uh, breakfast and lunch at all of our schools. We've been able to do that um, during um, COVID. Um, there were extensions that were provided through the federal government. Those have now ended, um, but we are eligible um, to be a full CEP district. Um, so we're applying for that and uh, this current year, but it doesn't impact FY23. Um, so our, our Title I and all of those allocations are going to be done just that ha as they have been in the past. So we won't see a change in any of those allocation formulas until 2024, um, but we're going to do whatever we can to minimize um, the impacts, but there's always changes in the allocations to the schools for Title I purposes based on the number of eligible students. Um, so it's, it's really nothing unusual from what they've already encountered. And we've also been very um, diligent in seeing what other, um, uh, what other resources required the use of that free and reduced lunch, and we're coming up with alternatives. And so by applying now, it gives us some time because we still have the free and reduced lunch numbers for this upcoming school year. So we will see if there are any changes maybe in about a year, but we're good at least for this upcoming year is what you're saying. Well, there, we've already looked at what everything that will be impacted and, and we're putting a process in place to make sure that it, it's seamless from a parent perspective, that, okay. that they won't see any Yeah, any I was just concerned about it. I, I mean, I understand, you know, from talking to Ms. Bomblow that we've got it covered, but I just, I kind of wanted to just hear that as a budget conversation as well. So thank you very much. Any other questions? Super dead. No, that concludes the workshop. Great job, everybody. Um, we've got a couple more workshops for you. Uh, I'll remind the team that brevity is a virtue. The, uh, the next policy up, though, these are all important. Uh, policy 2.085 is a proposed new policy that would establish a superintendent student advisory committee. And I know this is something that uh, the board has, has brought up and requested in the last, uh, over the course of the last year, I believe. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Mr. Oswald. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Please introduce Ms. Simmons for me there. Thanks. Yes, thank you, Mr. Burke. Yes, with me this evening, we have Janina Simmons, Manager of Equity and Access. So this is her first board workshop. So as anybody in their first time, please be gentle with her. You want us um, to be nice, huh? You want us be to nice. be nice for a change? Yes, <laughs> be nice. Her husband is the principal of Rivera Beach Preparatory Academy, as most of some of you know, too, as well. So she heard those shout outs, I'm sure she was texting him. Yes, also, we have Lisa Carmona and Bruce Harris online who helped us in development of this. And as you all know, over the last year or so, the board has been taking a lot of time in the development and updating of the mission statement where we educate, affirm, and inspire our students in an equity-embedded school system. 
And through those conversations, there were a lot of discussions about how do we elevate our student voice and making sure that they're part of the process and in particular through board discussion items, how do we create a formal process where that voice is lifted and inform us in many of these decisions. So this policy 2.085 um, is a result of working and researching other school districts throughout Florida, uh, throughout really the nation and different process and how different districts approach lifting up this student voice. So this is our proposed to the board here this evening. And this particular policy um, will provide an avenue for the superintendent in many different fashions, whether we're looking at policies, practices, school improvement, um, other decisions that really greatly inform students. Obviously, we're making decisions on a daily basis that really um, impact our students, so there's a lot of opportunity for that voice to be informed. Thank you, Mr. Oswald, for introducing me. Um, be gentle. <laughs> um, um, good evening, Superintendent Burke and the board. Um, so for the membership for the committee, um, it will consist of nine members, um, one student member appointed by each member of the school board, as well as a member appointed by the superintendent and a student member appointed by the district student governance, government association. Um, and it, that's what the expectation that um, it reflects the diversity of our student population. Um, and of course, parent consent is required for those students. That parent consent is um, for to serve on the SSC, um, the committee, as well as disclosure of any student information. And if a student is 18 or older, they can provide their own parent consent. The students have to be a sophomore, junior, or a senior in our school district. I mean, in our public schools. The term of, appoint, um, of appointment is one year, and they can reapply at the end of the year, and it, they serve in a voluntary capacity. Let me ask you a question before you move on. We have a com county council president that serves on the board at every board meeting. Why isn't that student part of this? Because your policy says that the person on this committee is going to report to the board every, every month but well, we already have a student rep that sits up here with us. So why is, is that priority, that person not the one instead of the, the one that's appointed by the student member appointed by the District Student Government Association? We already have the County Council of Student Government appoint their person to the school board. So shouldn't it, why didn't you do that one instead? So it may very well be that. We wanted to leave that up to the Student Government Association to make that decision if they wanted to give another opportunity since one student does have the opportunity to sit on, up here with this board, this may give another student an opportunity to lift their voice in another capacity. Or it may be one of the both, but we wanted to leave that up to the Student Government Association. Ms. Brill. Thank you. Since Mr. Barbieri asked a question, I figured I could slip my question in now, too. So my question, or actually my suggestion, I'm, I know the policy states, and you've stated, that to be eligible, they have to be a high school sophomore, junior, or senior. Um, I'd like to suggest they just have to be a high school student in our public schools. I don't really feel that we need to exclude the freshmen unless you had a particular reason. I know you looked at other districts, but I would like to open it up to any high school student. If there's no objections. That's fine. Let, me, let me go back to follow up. Again, I don't understand why we're going to have two different organizations appointing somebody to report to this board at the 5 o'clock meeting every month. It, does, it seems to me that they're going to, there could be a conflict between the two. We have one whole organization that's going to be telling what they want, and we're going to have the county council president sitting here who represents the county council of all student governments. Um, I just don't understand why we're not factoring that in. I know, you know we probably don't want an even number of members on this because we could add that person in as number 10 but it just seems to me that it's it's trying to duplicate something for that one student member that we already have a process in place to put them here at the dais with us every month so if the board wishes to have that that is not a problem but understand this is also a superintendent's advisory committee right. so the student government association will bring up items that they want to discuss across the district as well However, this will agenda may or will most likely be driven by the superintendent and some of the priorities and things that we want to get input on. Um, and the intent 
And further in the policy, we do discuss about this particular, an individual from this advisory committee would report out to um, the board under the superintendent's comments section um, in whatever subsequent board meeting would be coming as this would be a meeting quarterly. Ms. Brill, then Ms. Woodfield. Thank you. So just to circle back, well, I, I agree, you know, I have no problem with what Mr. Barbieri is suggesting and having that person also serve on the committee. I don't see any reason not to add that person, but I just wanted to get closure on what I suggested, if everybody's all right with it being a high school student and not excluding freshmen. I see not Ms. Woodfield. Um, I, okay, so I kind of don't see why a freshman would fit well into this group. Unfortunately, I just, I don't, I don't know. I kind of, just to follow up on your comment, I feel like you're a freshman, you need to spend at least a year at the school to get to know people and be able to be a, a true representative. But that's not what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to ask a question about was Mr. Barbieri's piece. I don't understand. There's two organizations for student government. I thought that this student member appointed by the student district student government association was potentially part of that same organization that Logan currently sits on right now. That's not true? They're two different true. organizations? It is the same organization, correct. Oh, it same is organization. Same. I thought you want, what you were re requesting is that particular individual that to be the appointee. Logan. Is that correct? Or am I? <clears throat> so it's the same? Same group. The same group. Same so group. They, could, they could decide they want somebody else to come, but that person is still going to, the other one is still going to be here? Correct. So let me just say this to follow up on that. When I'm talking to these students, and I talk to a lot of them, I have this great mentee still that I've been working with all year. She said that the most important thing is to have a piece of leadership on your resume. And I believe that she's right. And you know, I'm, I'm hounding her for what my kid needs to do to be as successful as she is in school. So I think creating more leadership opportunities among these students so that they can put something on their, on their resume is actually a really good thing. So if someone, like Logan, I'm just going to use her as an example, it happens to be super busy because she's taken on all these responsibilities and would like someone else to take that on. I think that should be a, an option for them. So let them pick whoever their person is, just like we're going to pick who our person is. And, and my goal is if I do get, if this goes through and I get to pick somebody, I'm going to go to my principals and ask for you know someone that's not traditionally in a leadership role because I think this is a great opportunity for a student to expand their horizons and show their leadership potential. Um, and maybe it's not the, you know, the valedictorian or the student body president. Someone else within the school can fill that role. Go ahead, Ms. Bro. I just want to circle back on the freshman. It, it's not intended to be someone that represents high school. It's someone that represents the student voice. And so I think that anybody um, in the high school capacity, freshman to senior, I think could serve in that role because certainly our freshmen have been through, in most cases, elementary and middle with us, or you know, part of that. So I think that, you know, I just don't want to exclude that younger person entering high school. And then, um, well, I guess we can get to this when we get up to um, the policy, the rest of it. I'm sorry. Why don't you go on? <laughs> okay. we'll try and be nice. Go ahead. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> So, all right. So, um, the policy duties and responsibilities, um, like other advisories, um, the advisory will be working under the Sunshine Law. Meetings will be governed um, by Robert's Rule of Order. The committee will meet quarterly, and they will report quarterly. Um, so, um, a, a representative from the committee will come and report quarterly to at the school board meetings, um, and also. Um, Elevating student voice on policies and procedures for our district. The the committee may conduct and lead student focus groups at um, different high schools throughout the year, and report that information to the superintendent, the school board, and district leadership also. And just similar to other policies, a quorum would be required in order to conduct a meeting. We will use the virtual option as well for our students, so that obviously transportation could be a potential issue. We want to make sure that. We get the attendance up. Um, in addition, community input can uh, be heard as well. So if, if we are doing the virtual option, which we will be doing, we'll just be sure to notify that so that if there's any public input that would want to occur during a meeting, voting, uh, 
All committee members have to be, will be eligible to vote um, as long as they're in person or virtually in person. Um, minutes will be kept of all of these meetings. Training will be conducted for all committee members um, on this policy in particular around Sunshine Law and understanding those particular issues when it comes to the, uh, Ann Roberts' rules of order. So now we'll go ahead and jump in to, to clarify some of those other questions that you may have. Let, let me ask you a question on Sunshine you mentioned. So this committee is going to be subject to Sunshine? Yes, it is. Okay. Ms. Ayala. Thank you. Super excited about this. Thank you for the work on this. This was one of the very first things I asked for since I've been on the board. And Dr. Pinoy was working on it, and I'm really glad to see this policy brought forward. Um, I'm all about this being for the students you have in here. To me, you nailed what you're trying to do in terms of representation for students that don't know where their place is on a campus yet, in terms of giving agency and voice to students, which is what our equity statement says. And this is important because we need to be getting the full picture of what our schools are offering to students, not just a very limited perspective of what that looks like. So I'm really excited about this. I think your presentations on recommendations all look pretty standard to me in terms of Robert's Rules Quorum, virtual presence and allowance. I'm glad that we're able to have that, thanks to Tallahassee. Um, but it looks good to me. I like it. Thank you for the work on it. And I look forward to seeing the continued policy move forward. Mrs. McQuinn. I've been thinking about the piece about um, our student government president reporting out and, and sitting with the board. I don't see a problem with the other, um, with the, I'm going to call it SSAC, um, the, the superintendent's student advisory committee standing at one of these mics and reporting out like any our um, academic advisory. When our student government president reports out, they're reporting on the student government meetings and what our student government association representatives have decided or have done or are doing. This other is advisory on issues that the superintendent is asking their input on. So I, I mean, I can see them not sitting up here. They report out like any other advisory committee, if that is any kind of um, agreement that we can make. I'm very comfortable with that. I also agree, while yes, freshmen um, do have the most recent memory of elementary and middle school, I think freshmen have enough to do and it is a whole new world for them. I'm very comfortable with the 10, 11, and 12th grade, and I did notice, I'm just pointing it out because I had a question about it, but on line 33, we do specify that it is a, um, a sophomore, junior, or senior in a district-operated public school. So I'm just pointing that out because it, a question came on my phone. Ms. Brill. Thank you, so um, I've got one thing that I don't know where it fits into it. Um, as far as opening it up to all high school students, we're only going to each be appointing one person, so I think we could leave it up to the student and the parent because you just don't know. I mean, they do have, I'm not going to pass any judgment on whether they have too much on their plate. But one thing I'd like to request, I know some of our advisory meetings are not um, like televised, they're not over 10. Um, and it's really hard to follow when you just listen to voices. I'd love to make sure that this committee that people in the public, especially students, get to watch it um, so that they can give their input. So I know there's a cost to that, but it's just my suggestion. I don't know how other people feel about it, but I, I think that it would be a good opportunity, especially for some of our student governments. They may want to watch you know, what goes on. It's going to give them more insight to the way things work um, and maybe a good way to get their input as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Mrs. Andrews, then Mrs. Whitfield, then Dr. Robinson. I'm very pleased with this. I like it. It gives the voice that we've been talking about to our students. We all get a chance to select someone. We also have the student council is not left out. They get a chance to select. And it's the superintendent's uh, student advisory committee working with us through the superintendent. So I think 
It's great, and this is what's being done all over the country, these committees that we're talking about right here. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield, then Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, let me just say, uh, to start, uh, thank you guys so much for doing this. I'm very, very, very excited. As you can tell, I'm all amped up about this conversation. Um, I feel like it's about time we listen to the students. Um, and so I, just to Mrs. McQuinn's point that she just brought up, um, I did I did think we should we should discuss this. Um, in that line where we say district-operated public school, I feel like we should just say public school and allow it so that if anybody chooses in the future to add a charter school that they can, because um, we do say that they're all our students. Um, and you know why, why we wouldn't want to hear from all our students, I don't know. So I think to put that line in there to exclude charters is kind of the way of the past, and I think we should kind of move past it. Dr. Robinson and Ms. Ayala. Thank you. Um, I think this is a fantastic start. Um, you know, I want to hear from lots more kids, but this is a fantastic start. Um, I'm good with the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. Um, I would like to consider whether or not we should have alternates for each one. Um, or I'm going to say something that's just going to, everybody's just going to reel in horror or double the number of kids. I mean, I just, I want, I want their voice. Right, and now I'm sitting here, if this was in place right now, I'm having trouble trying to figure out which one of the young people that I know I would want to put there, right? Whose voice I would want to amplify. And then all the ones I don't know, so I, I'm still clear that I want to, and actually you'll see an email to that effect that I want to figure out how to get more student voice. Um, but I, I also agree about um, revisiting this issue um, to allow charters, because I'm, I think, I think we have to start hearing why students choose to go to charters. There's going to be some messaging in there, I think, I hope. And I hope that we just take every opportunity to learn from our students so that we can improve how we serve them, including learning from the charter students so that maybe we recruit them back because we've improved what we're doing in our regular public schools. Thanks. Ms. Ayala. Thank you. Um, my one concern and question about that is, do we have say over charter operations? Okay, so I just, I just want to make sure we're being realistic about what the students can bring to us that we can actually implement. So just putting that out there as a thought. I'm okay with the, I guess my colleagues, I, I agree with them. We can have the two different uh, people if it turns out there's two different ones. I have a question on the on the term. It says one year term. School board members change can change in the middle of a year. So I need the policy needs to probably st state that once they're appointed by an outgoing, you know, an outgoing uh, school board member, they get to continue in that seat. So they don't find themselves as soon as the November election hits, all of a sudden they're pulled out and somebody else takes over. So the student should be given the opportunity to serve for an entire year. So the policy should be clear that that person serves until the end of the school year, mm -hmm. I think. Again, I just, I just want to clarify, just around the charter, the district operated, it was about informing district, district decision making. So that was why we were putting the district operated, just because those are the type of decisions that would inform us, not necessarily the charter school operations. And the rationale there. Also, to Ms. McQuinn's comments, this particular report out would happen under superintendent's report during whatever upcoming meeting. Slightly different than the advisory committees. On the issue of charters, uh, yeah, I, I understand where Dr. Robinson is coming from. I mean, I'd like to hear from charter school students too as to why they chose a charter school over one of the district operated schools. But since the superintendent has really no authority over the governance of, of a charter school and they can come here through him and tell us what they want done in their charter. I, I just don't see any point in having charter school students serve on the superintendent's committee when he has no authority over those schools, really any, any functional authority over those, over those schools. And so whatever they tell us that they want through him, we have no authority to make any changes anyway. So, Ms. Brill. Um, I want to change what I suggested about recording it. As I thought about it, it is the superintendent's advisory. And then I was thinking about safety for students. 
I think that might be something. I didn't, as soon as I said it and the words left my lips, I realized, no, you don't really want to be showing students like that. So please forget that suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Whitfield. So we may not have complete control over the charters, but we do have some control over the charters. Um, there, and I do believe it would go a lot in the future of collaboration in this district if we just took out the words district operated and just said public schools, because it would just undo that limitation so that it wouldn't, because we're creating policies. So we're saying that there'll never be a place where we need this, or is there a place for it? So there, there is some say that we have over charters is not huge, but um, hearing from those children, I think it can't hurt. And so as we're developing policy, just to be as inclusive as possible, I think is, is my argument. I'll leave it alone then, thank you. I guess we need to see a consensus on, the, uh, on a couple of these issues. Um, with respect to charter school participation, see a number of hands of people that want charter school participation. My hand was for comment, so call on me when it's time. You weren't, you weren't saying you are were consenting? Sure. I frankly have nothing against charter schools at all. If they're serving needs of kids that we're not serving their needs, I'm all for it. And I certainly agree with Dr. Robinson. We want to know in many instances why more and more students every year or their parents are electing charter schools. Um, I, but it is, and, and I guess their input can, can guide us in some decisions that the superintendent and staff want to make. That would boil down to, of the seven board members, deciding whether or not you want to use your appointee from a charter school. So frankly, I'm okay with either way. Ms. Burrell. Well, I was just going to ask the superintendent for his thought, since it's his advisory. You, my thought was along the same rationale as, as the team here, that the, the committee would help help us chart a course for our district schools that we have control over. So I, I didn't think of, the, you know, I see there's value in having their perspective and why they may have made that choice, but we were thinking more like, okay, strategic plan, we want to educate a firm, inspire each student, equity bed system, let's get their input. You know, we did some student focus groups, we went to our schools. That That's what I'm overseeing, so that that's, that would be my preference that we stick to our own students. But, and maybe there's another venue to figure out why we have kids that have chosen charter schools. I mean, I see that as valuable feedback, but I'm not sure this is the right place for it. Mrs. Andrews. I agree with Mr. Burke. I think that, you know, once we get this going, there could be a way that these leaders may want to have discussions with others. Uh, right now, we're talking about our district schools and what we can do through our superintendent. I do know that uh, visiting charter schools, being a part of what happens in charter schools, uh, I do that all the time. But I would love to see a way that there could be some collaboration with our leaders and leaders from the charter school so it could actually uh, formulate some kind of way that we can begin to have our leaders right here that work with the superintendent actually find ways to kind of meet with some of the leaders from the charter schools, the students. And so I think once we can get ourselves together with what we're doing, I would want to see us put something together where we can actually begin to start talking to others outside of district operating schools to hear what those students are saying and how we may be able to help them with what we do and how they may be able to help us. But right now, let's try to get ours straight first. That's how I see it. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So it's the superintendent's committee. So I will leave the issue of a charter school students being on this committee alone. However, I would like to see a plan on how we get feedback from the families who vote with their feet. We, we just don't do it, but we talk about the number of students we're losing to charter schools. But, and we I, don't ask why. We have to figure out why folks are choosing to leave us. It's like, you know, we, ju we just have to. I would like to hear a plan. Okay. I agree. It goes beyond charters. We need to look at homeschool, virtual school, family empowerment scholarships. We need to look at all our competition. 
Okay, so that takes us back to, um, was there any other issues that were, that you had that the board seemed to be split on? I'm hearing more towards 10th and 11th, 10th, 11th, 12th graders. Grade instead of 10, 11, and 12. Can I ask one question on that? Did the, the freshmen, did any thought go into the term and the timing of identifying the students, like the planning that maybe the freshman class hasn't assembled yet, but we wanna get the, the committee in place? I, I didn't know if that was part of our thinking. That was definitely part of the thinking and just a, a major transitional year for a student and many students make or break that freshman year. We want to get them on a solid track academically. So not to say that there aren't freshmen that can do it, but yes, you're correct. Go ahead, Ms. Burrell. Okay, so last try. Um, you know, there's only nine people that are gonna be on that committee. It doesn't mean that we're all gonna pick freshmen. I just think that we should leave it open because there may be a particular reason, like you may have a student that fits a certain diversity that maybe would be right in that year. And of course, the parent is gonna be a part of that decision. So it's not like we're opening up the floodgates to all of our freshmen who have other commitments. If it's too much, the family will say no. Um, you know, I certainly can identify already, well, maybe because I only have one high school, um, students at all levels that I could suggest for it. So, you know, I don't know that we necessarily have to go through, I'm glad I don't have to choose from amongst all my high schools. It's the one time that I have that benefit. Mrs. Andrews. Just, just to add a little bit more, you know, I have the uh, educational advisory groups in almost all of my cities and villages in District 6, and usually it's a senior that sit on, just like we have a senior that sits here. I think we're opening ours up to a sophomore, a junior, uh, and, a, and a senior, and we just opened a, a, a educational advisory group at Westlake, and they did go down a little bit to get some, you know, someone at the 11th grade level. But usually, it is the upper level uh, students that uh, are representing uh, at this level. All right, board members, we need to do a, a, have a consensus so when the administration brings a policy back, that it's clear whether ninth graders are included or not. So, how many of you are in favor of including ninth graders instead of just 10, 11, and 12? Okay, so that's settled. So it's 10, 11, and 12. At least that's what we're going to vote on when you bring the policy back, right? <laughs> and not to, to belabor this, but Mr. Barbier, and your Student Government Association, you're are you I'm, clear I'm fine. That? I'm fine with the way you have it. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. Anything else, board members? Mr. Like Superintendent, move quickly. All right, we're blazing new trails. So th thanks for your help with that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, our fourth and final workshop, and I, the reason these workshops are coming to you today is so that they can impact the upcoming school year. With your policy timeline, these will be coming for the ultimate adoption on August 3rd. So the next one's policy, proposed new policy 5.0115, student photo identification badge, also known as universal student ID, and the team's been putting a lot of work into uh, bringing this together. So we have Mr. Joseph Sanchez, Chief Operating Officer, Allison Monblu, Director of School Food Service, Mr. Michael Callahan, manager, I'm sorry, director <laughs> of uh, program management, right? Yeah. Our project management, PMO. All right, so um, as some of you board members may be familiar with, we've been working on um, a process to use student IDs for a variety of reasons, which we're gonna talk about here today. Um, in order to do that, we need to have a universal policy on student IDs, and, um, and that's what uh, Ms. Blue has been working on along with the team. And uh, so I'm going to turn it to her. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Good evening, Mr. Burke and board members. Um, so today the policy number is 5.0115 on student photo identification badge, which would be short ID badge. The purpose of this policy it's a new policy being considered in order to outline the guidelines for the acceptable use of ID badges. The school district recognizes the use of student ID uh, photo identification badges, the ID badge, will provide for greater safety, accountability, and efficiency in schools. The intent of the policy is to have a district-wide consistent ID badge utilized by all Palm Beach County students. If this goes forth, um, the accomplishments we hope of the policy will be to set guidelines for those schools and students who are already utilizing ID badges. 
provide consistency across all Palm Beach County school districts, schools, and allow for badging on and off school buses for student location and accountability. It will also allow for more streamlined meal service and accountability for federal funding. It will allow for student accountability and safety while on school grounds. It will allow for additional use cases such as media center book uh, checkout, tardiness procedures, aftercare, parent pickup, and reunification process in case of emergencies. For the policy development, um, there is a student photo ID project team, and that team was led by Director uh, Michael Callahan. And these are the members. Um, you can see it's a diverse group of uh, people across the district that have been participating in this project rollout. And they also had um, some weigh-in and conversation about this policy. We also looked at some other districts' policies um, and pulled some information from those policies to design this one. The provisions of the policy um, are detailed in the remaining slides here, so we're going to be going over student ID badges, the responsibility of administrators, the use of mobile technology, replacement of lost or stolen IDs, fraudulent use of cards, notice to parents and guardians, and also denial of services. In the student ID badge section, um, the student ID will be provided by the student school and will remain the district, um, district property. The ID badges will display the student's current school, their name, photo, student number, and also the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, which is um, mandated to be on the back of student ID badges. Policy 5.50 is the student education records, and inside that policy, it, we have where the, normally the parents would have to consent when information is being released. The information that is appearing on the student ID badge may be considered directory information. And so um, the section in this policy, 5.0115, that we're looking at right now, is acknowledging the language in policy 5.50, but it's stating that we will be utilizing the student ID badges without parental consent. And that is actually allowed by federal law. Federal law states that the parents cannot withhold consent with regards to any information on student ID badges. Also in the student ID badge section is how the ID badges can be worn. Uh, we have discussion in there about uh, breakaway lanyards, ID clips, attached to backpacks, things like that. When the ID badges need to be returned to the school, if they're matriculating to a different school or they leave the district and they're graduating. And also no sharing or duplicating of badges. The next section is the responsibility of administrators. Administrators will need to communicate to parents and students about the ID policy, providing uh, the initial and replacement ID badges, and also any collection of costs for lost or stolen ID badges. Then the use of mobile technology. Uh, we are stating in there that it can be used as a replacement for the ID badge if the technology is available. This would be intended for infrequent use, not all the time, because we do want to have the badge on the students for identification purposes. Then replacement of lost or stolen ID badges. Um, the action the student administration must take in the event an ID badge is lost or stolen. The first replacement will be at no cost. Subsequent replacements, um, there may be a fee assessed. No fee would be assessed for homeless students. And then any consequences for uh, five or more replacements would be following the student code of conduct. And then the fraudulent use of ID badge section um, talks again about any consequences will be in compliance with the student code of conduct. Notice to the parent or guardian if there isn't any end of the year obligation that the parent or guardian would be notified. Denial of services. Uh, services will not be denied to any student if their ID badge is not present. And then our next steps would be um, the policy development on June 15th and adoption on August 3rd. Okay, Ms. McQuinn, Ms. Brill, and then Ms. Whitfield. So currently, um, schools have their own rules. Uh, I'm, I'm referring to lines 27 through 29, sorry. Um, there are many schools who allow only lanyards. 
And I see the piece about not being around machinery or on the playground. We certainly have many schools, I can tell you at least in North County, who are at PE with those lanyards. I see many reasons not to have them on their backpacks. So I think you just want to get a little bit more input there on uh, is that a school center decision about whether they are on their wrists or wherever. We were really, yes, leaving that up to the school center as to what was working best for whether it was elementary, middle, or high school, ESE students, that type of thing. So if, we, so, so if, if it is a school center decision, then let's have that in the policy. Please. Ms. Brill. Thank you, and I really like this idea, but I do, to my mind, I'm getting a lot of the challenges are coming into my mind. So um, I have a few questions. I was going to ask what happens when a student forgets their badge, but I know you said that services won't be withheld. Are you going to give them something temporary? If Because that could be a nightmare, too, if a lot of children forget it. Right. A lot of the schools right now, the high schools, what they're doing is if they forget it, they either get a temporary pass to go to the school um, or they also can go in and get another badge right then that morning. And then as a follow-up, if I can follow up with a couple more, ESC students, that's going to be a real challenge um, because you're going to want them to have the badge and not, not give it to them because they'll feel included and if they don't have one, they're going, you know, you'll identify that they can be more identifiable, but I can also see them forgetting them, losing them. So I think that you're going to have to make allowances, you know, for that population because remembering things is, you know, it will help them in, and it could be an IEP goal for the students, which would serve them well, but I just wanted to throw that out there and then Tied in with that would be the cost of replacement for students in elementary school. I can see that there's going to be some challenges um, in them not losing it. Um, so I guess those are things you're going to have to iron out in the policy later on. But I just want to make sure that you know we don't exclude anyone because we know that they are going to lose it or have issues with it. But I do think it's an opportunity to teach responsibility to some of our younger students and our ESE students. So thank you. Yeah, great. And just as, as an example, we have a pilot going uh, at the Royal Palm School uh, for bus ridership, and all of those kids have the badges attached to their backpacks. Okay, so it, again, it, it, we're, we, we've worked with ESC, Kevin McCormick. Uh, we, we brought in all everyone we could think of who could help us craft this solution. So I appreciate your remarks. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, let me just say uh, I'm so excited. I feel like I'm sounding a little bit more like Dr. Robinson every day where I'm like, <laughs> yay, finally. <laughs> um, this is something I've wanted ever since we had um, the tragedy at Stoneman Douglas. I thought we should have uh, consistent IDs for all our students um, so we knew who was there and who's supposed to be there and if they could go into areas or not. So I'm thrilled about it. Um, but I do want to bring up the, the concern about um, students that go by a name that is not their name. Um, and how we are planning on dealing with that. Um, and if it's possible, um, I would love to see us add to the policy that if a parent approves a name change, um, you know, be it a nickname or whatever, um, that we allow that to be printed on their badge instead um, of their name um, so that we can accommodate uh, the, all of our students. Do you have any comments? Yeah, about? right. So our approach now, these badges are going to be printed from our SIS system. Focus and our approach now is actually to use their preferred name on on the badge. Okay, so as we are going forward, making sure that we get preferred names is that something that goes into the when we do the registration form, and is it something that can easily be changed if someone a student comes in and says, "I don't like this name. This isn't what I go by." Can we fix that like fairly easily? My understanding is that's a simple data processor change at the school, and then it's updated in SIS, and we can we can you know, print them okay. uh, a new badge virtually immediately. Wonderful, I'm very grateful, thank you. Mrs. Andrews, then Dr. Robinson. We touched on this a few minutes ago about having to pay for the badge. And certainly I do wanna encourage responsibility too, but I do want to have some kind of option out there uh, for students 
who may not have that money and whatever that situation might be. And sometimes a lot of our schools aren't, students aren't as responsible as others for many reasons. And so I would hope that they would all be responsible and never lose their badge, but it could happen. And so I really want there to be something in place where uh, it's evaluated by the teacher, or the principal, and there should be some kind of mechanism in place where, you know, if they don't have that money and it's been a second time and we do know what the issue is, that somebody will be able to have, make sure they have a badge. I really don't want them not to be safe because, I mean, I see the schools that have the, the badges and they're all different everywhere, but when I see the badge, at least I know where they belong. So when we get this policy and we get it all straight, I don't want there to be a few students in every school that's having a little issue with keeping up, paying for it, and it gets to be almost like a lunchroom thing where, you know, you don't have your money because you lost your ticket or whatever. So let's try to figure out some kind of comprehensive thing that, you know, a principal has the, has the power to do something to help certain students. Principals and teachers know who their students are, and they will try to help them with the parents to help the children be responsible. So have a little system in place. And that's actually, thank you for bringing that up. That's why we put the fee may be assessed so that it does lie in the hands of the principal. Yeah. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, there is something about having the student number on the ID badge that bothers me. Um, it seems it's just too, I don't know. I, I, I can't even explain it except to say if the student lost it in Publix, that I, I don't know. I, 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 why is, does it need to be on there? I get the name. <laughs> I get the name. I get a great big like school logo, whatever it is. But why, why do we need the student yeah. number? Um, the barcode is also on there, so as they go through most of, like whether they're getting on the bus or they're going through the lunch line, we'll be scanning them with a barcode. Mm -hmm. um, the ID is just for those systems that may not have the barcode that they might need to type it in, or if a scanner's not working at that particular point, that you might be able to type the, the student number in. Right, it, it's also if, if, for, if for example, um, uh, the younger students, if they, you know, if, if the scanner isn't working for some reason, expecting them to remember their seven digit barcode you know their student id might might be a bit of a reach so um we we, we actually did kind of go back and forth on this uh, the, a little bit overall but the general consensus was that there was more value to having the student id on it than there was um the the, the downside to possibly uh, having it exposed but okay and so Okay, I still had the same reservation. Somehow my anxiety has not been addressed yet, but um, but now I have a new one. So the <laughs> so the barcode can anybody like so the people who are walking through Walmart with the barcode scanner thing, they can scan the ID and get all the students' information. No, 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 no. Just okay. their it. The barcode is the student ID. So okay. so the student ID it, it's displayed numerically and then it's presented as a barcode as well. Okay, so that, but they could get the student student number. Student number, thing. yes, ma'am. Okay, I don't know. It's you know, it's anxiety, I guess. Um, but or maybe we could follow that up later. But I have another concern. So when I was reading it, so I appreciate the fact that you, you specifically state homeless students would not be charged if they lose their ID. I appreciate the fact that you you know, left some discretion for the schools. I appreciate the fact that you said they had to lose it five times before somebody gets charged, right? No. Uh, before discipline. Discipline, mm -hmm. okay, see, that's a problem. So can we find, so I, I don't have the answer right now. I think I need coffee, but the, some natural consequences of of losing your ID. Like, I don't know what that might be. I don't want to try, deny them access to their education, obviously. I don't know, and I'm, I'm gonna say this, and it sounds bad right after I say it, but maybe then they're the last ones in the lunch line. I mean, there's gotta be something that students care about that they, that they're negatively impacted if they're losing their ID. Yeah, and it was, it was based on the student code of conduct level one. 
So those are some of the things I believe that they can make those decisions to do in the level one section. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. I don't have a, a is, I don't uh, have a suggestion for you, but I would like for them to not get coded. I would like for them to have yeah. some talks, kind of inconvenience before it reaches this disciplinary level. Yeah, I talked about um, parent or guardian contacted, conference with the student, conference with the parents, um, uh, plan meeting, daily weekly report, schedule change. Um, those were just some of the things that are in the student code of conduct. Mm -hmm. policy under that level one so it didn't go to level two three or four it was sort of a very mild consequence okay. i'll ask we my grandchildren to, yeah. they'll tell me <laughs> okay because we have to have what? something that is important to the children that gets inconvenienced yeah. if they're losing their id now I could promise you, my grandson doesn't care about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I was Those just reading off some codes. of the things that were in that in that um, says after school detention, um, mentoring. So I, you know, maybe there's one that can be added in here that would be more impactful that wouldn't go to a higher level. Okay, I'm just asking that we brainstorm it. It doesn't need to be coded. It's just something that is the student is inconvenienced if they're losing their ID. Thank you. Let me ask a question on the uh, printing the ID, student's ID number on the badge. What can you do with that ID? I mean, I've seen the kids go up to the cash register in the schools and they type in their ID. So what's going to keep one middle school kid from saying, I don't have my ID, my badge with me today, but here's my number, and they punch in somebody else's number. How are we going to keep kids from stealing? I mean, those, the kids right now, they don't, I don't think they give their numbers to their friends. But now everybody's going to have access by looking at I know what that kid's ID number is, and then what happens when they start getting into the system and figure out a way to get in there and look at grades and everything else. I mean, I know my grandson comes over and he types his ID in on, on, on the district mm -hmm. website, and he's able to get in and see all of his grades and everything. I, I know you need a password for that, but once a kid finds out what a password is, I'm just worried about, it's like having a social security number out there where mm -hmm. everybody in the world can see the social security number. I don't think we should be advertising the student ID number to other students in the school. It just uh, it concerns and, me that they have access to those numbers. Yep, sorry, I, I understand the, the, the concern. Um, what I can tell you is that that risk exists at the majority of places that have student IDs now because the vast majority of them have the student ID on it. And that's, I think, 87% of our, of our high schools, 75-plus um, percent of our middle schools. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not downplaying your, your concern at all. I'm just saying that's a, that, that's a risk that we're, that we're taking um, at many places now. Is the student's name on the ID badge? Yes. And there's a barcode that also, if it's scanned, will show what the student's ID number is? Show, right, so, so show his looks, student number. Okay, so if the school can figure out what the ID badge is and their cash register can figure it out by scanning the barcode, why do we need the number printed out for everybody to see? Why? Yeah, we just didn't know if there was some other use case for it where they wouldn't have a scanner for it, or if the scanner w wasn't working for some reason. If um, the system went down and the kids had to come through the line, we have to write their numbers down. Instead of asking them what their name is or their number, we'd be easily be able to write their numbers down and record them. And same thing, I don't know, getting on the bus if the system's exactly. not working, oh, they would have the number right there to be able to... Mr. Can I just offer, this is a workshop, so we've got a little time before we bring it back for uh, development and adoption. Why don't we, let's wrestle through the pros and cons on that a little bit more and either okay. bring back and reaffirm our position or see if we have latitude there. Mm -hmm. I can be swayed either way on the ID, but I can tell you that I don't know of a North County school that doesn't have the ID badges with the numbers and I hesitate to even say this, I have never in five years received a parent concern about the badges. Ms. Whitfield? I was just gonna say, I feel like my kid knows her ID number better than her name, and uh, she's, she tells me it all the time. I still haven't figured out what it is, but I, I do hear it from her all the time. I'm almost thinking that it's less risk than, than the name because you can't really do anything with it unless you're part of the school district. So I, I don't see the risk as being as high um, as is being discussed today. So I don't really have a problem with it staying on there. Sanders? I'm just happy for the consistency. 
and uh, as I see children with their ID badges, it makes me feel so much comfortable that I know they belong to a particular school that I'm moving around in. If after school, the bus stop. We see them everywhere with their ID badges, and it helps me to know that they're going to be safe because somebody knows that they're part of this group where they are. So the consistency is just so different all around. Different schools have different things going on, some form of ID, and it was better than nothing. This is so much better that it's going to be consistent and it's going to be universal that you can use it for a whole lot of things, especially for the buses, mm -hmm. so that when we have people getting on the bus that should not be on the bus, that's going to trigger. So I, I think it's good. I really, really do. Mr. Sanchez, on the buses, will they be scanners or are they going to be like the black boxes that are outside doors where you put the ID up against it and it registers? No, I think we're going to have both, right? Yeah. All, of the, all of the buses currently have barcode scanners mounted as you right. walk in the door right now. The entire fleet does. Okay, so... so we, we, are going to, we are going to need handhelds as well because yeah. some, some kids are going to have it on book bags and other things, so the handhelds work. Is it easy to use those? Put the, put, are the scanners less expensive than those things we put on the doors? And my my well, question is, I can give you a dozen schools right now where the teachers for a year and a half haven't had badges, mm -hmm. but if all the if we can get you know 180,000 badges out to kids, but we can't get teachers badges, then maybe we should switch the barcodes for teachers too, so they let the schools print out the bar the teachers ID cards at mm -hmm. the schools. I mean, you know, Mr. Sanchez, I've told mm -hmm. you, I've got dozens of schools that I've been contact, contacted by that the teachers don't have ID cards. They don't have badges. Mm -hmm. And they've, it's been a whole year. It's the end of the year, and they still don't have their badges. I've been told by school police it's because they don't have the personnel to, to get those badges made. And I've suggested, well, f let's find an outside company. And I guess that's not feasible either. But if, if it's that easy for schools to print up badges, that they're, they're register kids or registers and buses, then let's have the schools for prepare the badges for their teachers and change all those damn black boxes to, I, to scanners so that these teachers can get indoors if they need to get into rather than worry about them stuck out in the parking lot with, with somebody out there hurt, hurting kids and they can't get in the building because that's a situation we have in a lot of the schools right now. I told you about a situation on a playground. The teacher goes out on the playground with her kids and she can't get back in because she doesn't have a key to the door. She's got to beat on the door to have somebody open it up. If there's a problem out there where somebody's hurting children, she can't get in because the black box is not there or you know, she doesn't have her ID in the first place. So, I mean, you make it sound very simple that we're going to get ID cards printed up by all the schools for you know, 180,000 kids then let's let them do the teachers too so that we end that problem that's been going on now for years where the teachers and employees don't have their badges to get in the building doors. So why don't we start looking at changing all these over to scanners and get rid of those, those, those other things that we're currently using that, uh, that we can't seem to make enough of. Well, in, in Chairman Barbieri, I don't want to get too off topic too much, but we actually are likely going live next week with outsourcing fingerprinting for the district um, and, and having a pilot going with that. So we are working towards outsourcing the majority of the badges for the district uh, to a third party. And, and, and I work uh, heavily with school police and um, HR. Uh, that's another project that, that we're working on. And um, we're, we're confident that, that we're on the right track to really have a much improved badge process uh, for, the, for, the, for the summer and certainly for the fall next year. All right, so come fall, the teachers in all of our schools are going to have badges. That's, that's yeah, your intent. It's, yes, it's not sir. fair to that's put that on intent. Mr. Callahan. I no. appreciate you jumping in, <laughs> and you're, no. you'll be back to the table soon, I'm it's sure. Okay. Yeah. But uh, me, I'll take that yeah, on no, along you can, with the leadership you, team. You can remember my face, if not the name, but, but uh, you know. <laughs> well, you volunteered it, so I thought you were in okay. charge of that. No, but so, somebody yep. needs to make sure that our teachers get badges in the fall. The whole school year went by without teachers having badges. It needs to end with the security concerns that we have in the schools. Teachers should have badges that open doors. They shouldn't have to go begging for a year to find a badge. Yeah. At one school, the principal's badge doesn't open the door. So it's like, enough. It's enough. Mrs. Andrews. I know we have to stop, but some schools have a little bit more money than others. So whatever happens here, I want to make sure it's equitable that everybody, every school, everywhere, can get this because it's going to be a good thing. And, you know, with the bus thing, it's a mm -hmm. big deal with kids getting on the bus that they're not supposed to get on. So if we can be have this universal piece here for the teachers as well as the students, I think it's great. So make sure that it's equitable and everybody can get it. Some schools have very fancy badges, and some just have the regular 
whatever they can afford. So let's kind of make it uniform so everybody can have what they need and it looks the same for everybody. Yeah, thanks. And from the start, we, we have recognized this as an equity issue and we are committed to, to making sure that it is equitable across the district. Thank you. Other questions? Superintendent. Now that concludes our workshops. Thank you. And once again, it's, it's nice to see this work advance. This is something that was overdue and we're excited to get this moving. Thank you. So we need to adjourn the workshop. Yeah, I haven't got okay. there yet. Give me a minute. We need a motion to adjourn the workshop so we can start the special meeting. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. Ayala. All in favor, opposed, motion carries. 7 0. All right, I'll call the special meeting of the School Board of Palm Beach County to order at 7 08 p.m. Uh, we have four, three sets of minutes to approve. We need a motion. Motion by, Ms. by Dr. Robbins and second by Mrs. Andrews. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We have no items being added for good cause. Mr. Superintendent, are you withdrawing anything? No, sir. Board members, what items have you pulled? Dr. Robinson? LD1. MV1. LD1. Legal. LD. D1. <laughs> Any other items, board members? We need a motion to approve the agenda then as modified by a uh, motion made by Mrs. Andrews, second by <clears throat> Mrs. McQuinn. <clears throat> Excuse me, any discussion? You pulled it off, though. <clears throat> as soon as the board clerk pulls it off, you'll re re uh, restart your... Uh, your agenda so that it, it appears under new new uh, new business. I think I took the, the, the motion on approving the agenda. It passed 7 0. Um, disclosures and abstentions, anyone? Mr. Superintendent, comments? Yes, uh, this is the first time that we've met as a group in a formal meeting since the horrific attack at Robb Elementary School in Texas. I'd like to take a, a moment of silence for the victims and their families. Thank you. You know, our nation has watched this tragedy unfold in horror, and I'm sure it's raising some questions within our community about the safety measures that are in place across our schools. Um, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas tragedy on February 14th in 2018, you know, altered our landscape forever. Uh, it prompted a great deal of legislation in the state of Florida and a series of mandates that we work hard to comply with. Um, our district takes a multi-pronged approach to help prevent school violence that includes mental health professionals, ongoing threat assessments, you know, online tip apps such as Fortify Florida, uh, a school resource officer on every campus, an array of security equipment. Uh, but I think it's necessary that I start, that I work with our communications team uh, to get more information out to our parents and community at large regarding the safety measures that are currently in place. And uh, as a, just a reminder, a great deal of our mental health and security Safety initiatives are made possible by the, the one mill referendum that's due for renewal in November. Uh, also, we'll be working with Chief Mooney and our entire team to determine how we might be able to go further and fortify in our campuses for the upcoming school year and beyond. Um, but anyway, just wanted to share with the board. I, I know it's on front and center of everyone's mind. Uh, I do also want to just congratulate the entire school district and the team and our staff and our students for wrapping up a very successful 21-22 school year. Uh, we ended school last Thursday. We also wrapped up our graduations, which I know the, the board members were actively participating in. And, you know, we graduated about 12,300 students from our district operated schools. And those ceremonies was, uh, went off without a hitch. Uh, the student speeches were inspiring. <laughs> and uh, it was just really rewarding to, to see, uh, you know, the fruits of our labor here as the students graduated. Uh, we've also, you know, want to thank tomorrow we'll be having a uh, retiree breakfast. So that's the bittersweet, bittersweet part of this. We end a school year and that also means that we're going to be losing some of our dedicated employees. So we'll be recognizing them tomorrow. And uh, at the upcoming June 15th school board meeting, we are going to recognize some of the individuals that were so key in orchestrating the uh, graduation ceremonies. That, that completes my 
comments, Chairman? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. McQuinn, nothing. Ms. Ayala? I do today. Um, first, happy Pride Month to our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer LGBTQ plus community. I stand proudly as your ally and commend your determination to do whatever it takes to help us achieve equality for all. While it has been a difficult year for LGBTQ rights, and we certainly have a lot of work to do to make our schools as inclusive and accepting as possible, I commit to supporting our entire system of teachers, staff, and students in their right to be proud and unapologetically themselves, regardless of attempts to silence you. Next, I wanted to follow up on the superintendent's comments because as a school board member and someone who's been, I think, like most of the entire world, shaken to my core by the unspeakable horror that we saw in Uvalde, Texas, I felt a sense of duty and felt compelled to speak directly to the community tonight about that. Many parents, teachers, and community members have been reaching out, you know, totally understandably to us as the board, as well as the district with questions and concerns that I felt deserved acknowledgement. And I wanted to share some practices that our district has in place in the hopes that information sharing, transparent communication, and what I hope will be a small sense of reassurance. To start, all district sites have comprehensive school safety plans in place. Working in conjunction with our police department, school-based administrators receive training and engage in conversations to ensure everyone is on the same page. School site safety analysts conduct site visits and spot checks to verify and test things like point of entries, campus camera function, key card access authorization, functioning locks, gate functions and access, and other compliance expectations. Next, I think the absolute most important part of everything that the police department does is just train. Frequent, up-to-date, comprehensive training all the time. Our officers are trained on active shooter techniques frequently and regularly, and they're trained to engage threats, not to act, uh, to act and not to wait. They are trained to respond. Integrated training that's been based on FBI's best practices occurs between all partner agencies from around Palm Beach County that we work with, and additional trainings are being planned to ensure that we're up to date on the latest techniques. Here in Palm Beach County Schools, as the superintendent mentioned, thanks to our generous taxpayers supporting the 2018 referendum, we have improved and expanded school resource officer programs, funded new mental health programs, and done more for security than ever before. And we're also actively exploring more ways to enhance security with new technologies that help teachers information share quickly in the event of an incident. In Palm Beach County, we're committed to student safety and the collaborations required to ensure that. ASHER, or the Active Shooter Hostile Event Response, launched in 2020, is a first of its kind agreement with law enforcement, fire rescue, emergency management, healthcare, and trauma centers. This coordinated response plan includes all municipal law enforcement and fire departments, as well as PBSO and Palm Beach County Fire Rescue. In Florida, after the tragedy at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, action was taken. The minimum age to purchase firearms was raised to 21. There, they instituted a mandated three-day waiting period for gun purchases, and red flag, lags, uh, red flag laws empowered law enforcement to keep guns out of the wrong hands. Safe schools are built on trusting relationships that take time to build among students, staff, administrators, and our officers. And the most important thing I think we have going for us here in Palm Beach County is that we have really strong, positive relationships amongst ourselves and other agencies because this is a team effort. And to that end, after speaking at length with our police chief, Sarah Mooney, she recommended exploring the creation of a security committee to function either regionally or as a district-wide advisory board. This would help provide avenues for additional communication and insight among schools, parents, students, and the community. And I wanted to request that this recommendation be considered at a time in the future and that the previously rescheduled um, security discussion be scheduled as soon as possible. Preventing violence by detecting and addressing behavioral red flags is a proactive step and is more effective than physical security measures and definitely after the fact, which reactiveness is not something we can afford. We have to be proactive. And Palm Beach County Schools are committed to the work that's required to keep our schools safe. I'm very much looking forward to what Chief Mooney will bring to the department with her leadership. Thank you. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Ms. Ayala for that detailed, um, that detailed recap of our security um, information. I feel like um, this past week, and though I'm not as eloquent as she is in writing this ahead of time, um, this past week has been really tough talking to families 
about what happened um, in Texas and trying to reassure them about their students and reassure myself because I have to send my daughter to school too. So I'm um, telling myself whether or not it's a good deal to send my kid to a school and are we doing a good enough job? So uh, I've really tried to take it on to talk to as many of the parents who have written to us as possible. Um, you know, I've given out my cell phone number and asked them to call me personally because um, you know, I think mom to mom, I can have that conversation, what, that, what that's like. And I've had some moms really crying with me on the phone about how afraid they are to send their children to school. And that is, uh, that's real tough. Um, it's real tough for us because I want to make sure that our kids are protected. So what I would just say with my comments today is that uh, for the families out there that are watching and listening, um, I want to let you know that, that I hear you um, and I understand what you're going through and uh, that tragedy uh, has really hit home for me. Um, I think as a school district, we have to do a better job of communicating our security um, plans uh, so that families understand. What I have asked every parent that I've talked to is to please reach out to your principals and talk to them. I think that we should be giving tours of our schools that involve showing why their children are protected, how we are doing single point entry, showing uh, where their children will be, and then really listening to the parents about any suggestions that they have. I've had some really good ones this week, which I'll be sharing uh, with our staff, but um, just to follow up on everything that's going on in Texas, I want to know, I want the families here to know that we take this extremely seriously. Um, and it is my priority to make sure that going forward, we have great communication with you about, about how your children are gonna be safe, um, both in this summer and um, in our next school year. And I hope you'll cont continue to trust us with your children, just as I trust my child here at this district. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and uh, we can piggyback on each other. Uh, happy Pride Month. Uh, we really support our children, all of our children, and our LGBTQ plus kids. We're excited, and families, we're excited to celebrate with you this month. And yes, um, the tragedy in, in Texas, it was horrendous, and Mr. Burke, uh, Chief Mooney, uh, and the team here, you've been keeping us informed about the security measures that we have here. We need to make sure that we uh, get the message out to our community to let them know that our schools are safe. I'm so happy we had the referendum some years ago to put a police officer in every school. And just tonight, I heard Mr. Sanchez talk about uh, the uh, single point of entry uh, sheds uh, that some of our schools have and others don't, where we have it so that we can't let somebody get in. They've got to go one way to get in with cars or folks coming in. So we're actually putting funds in place to make sure everything is hardened and everybody's looking at how they can get in to our school, but we have to make sure that we're ahead of the game to make sure we keep it closed so that our students are safe, our teachers uh, and our staffs are safe. So we, we pray uh, for the families in Texas and we know things do happen, but we have to put our money where our mouth is and, and put in place procedures, uh, programs, officers, support systems so that we can keep our schools safe. Uh, I did want to say something about the CDL graduation. I want to thank Mr. Burke for coming and, and giving a few words to the 15 new uh, uh, people from Palm Beach County that received their CDL license uh, at that uh, event was uh, Mr. Tierney as well as uh, Chief of Staff uh, Jay Vargas. And there was 15 young people who uh, completed 320 hours uh, in the program with 1,000 miles behind the wheel receiving their CDL uh, certificates. The next step is to take the test and so they're getting ready to do it and we hope to have a, another class coming through, but this was the first inaugural class for Palm Beach County School District for training of CDL. 15 people received that uh, certificate on last Friday. So congratulations to them and congratulations to all of the graduates. And the graduations, uh, Mr. Burke, I don't know how you did it. You did it, we all did it, all those students did it and their parents. It's been an exciting time over the last couple of weeks. So congratulations to all. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I'd like to have a moment of silence for Roman Phelps, 
the young man that was murdered on the campus of Dreyfus, if you would please. Thank you. Ms. Brill. Thank you. So I'm not going to be redundant and repeat what people have been saying, but I think the public needs to know that there are going to be things that we do security-wise that you will not hear about because we can't tell the public everything. We don't want to open up the door for people to, to try and work around us. But yes, I do believe our schools are safe. I did speak to the superintendent this week about our communications that we need to communicate more to parents before the start of the school year to give them that confidence. But I will also share with you that I have relatives that work in the classroom. I have my own son that works in the schools. Do I fear that they are not safe? No, I do not. I do believe that we have wonderful security measures in place. Um, I feel very confident, but I want the public to hear that as well. And, and last, I'll just say, we always have to keep telling everybody, if you see something, say something. In many cases, that has worked. We know that. Um, but we have to keep reiterating that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brill. Board members, we have no public speakers, so unless anyone wants to pull anything else from consent, I'll take a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor, opposed, motion carries 7-0. Mr. Superintendent, LV-1. I recommend the school board approve the settlement agreement in the case of Sarit Levy versus School Board of Palm Beach County, case number 502021CA005727 XXXXMB, and authorize the chairman, superintendent, and general counsel to sign all necessary documents. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Dr. Rose. All right, any comments? Any? All right, all those in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-1 with Dr. Robinson in opposition. Eleanor, one? I recommend the board approve the proposed school calendars for the 2023-24 and 2024-25 school years as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, seconded by Ms. Ayala. Discussion, Ms. Brill. Um, I'm not going to go into my discussion, but I pulled it so that I could vote against it. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries 6-1 with Vice Chair Brill in opposition. LR2. I recommend the board approve the attached tentative agreement pending ratification by the Association of Educational Secretaries and Office Professionals, known as ASOP. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Mrs. Whitfield. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, and this was just in, ASOP did ratify, so we're good to go. Uh, LR3, I recommend the board approve the attached tentative agreement pending ratification by SEIU slash FPSU. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? That's motion passes unanimously. And SEIU has also ratified it. Yes, so we're, we're all set there, thank you. All right, we have two board discussion items, BD1, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. This was um, just a request based on prior board conversation to have a uh, workshop on potentially restructuring alternative ed. So it was just a request to schedule a workshop on alternative ed. Okay. We'll work that into the future calendar. Sanders? I like that. Mm -hmm. We have consensus on this one? Yes, okay. We've got the board consensus on All that. Right. Thank you. BD2, a, a board discussion, Dr. Robinson, unpacking economic mobility. Yeah, thank you. So at Children's Services Council, we had this presentation by the Florida Alliance of Children's Councils and Trust. It was called Unpacking Economic Mobility, and it was really about the benefits cliff, right, where people get a little bit of a raise, but it takes them kind of over the edge so that they lose benefits. But the part, and so this is a request that we have, um, that we find some time for this presentation to be made to the board. The, the thing that was really, um, what's the word, in, uh, important to me was the, they showed these various charts of financial resources and basically showed, um, in many cases, for single parents that... <laughs> that they reached this, this point of um, near or at 
uh, financial sustainability after their children leave home, right? So we all know children are a financial burden, right? <laughs> so it was clearly pointed out there, right? But, but the other thing was they also had some charts of people who um, did the career ladders with the, the stacked credentials, right? And they had one in particular that they showed of um, somebody who went from CNA to LPN to RN, right? And it was through a specific program where they coached them through. But it really showed um, basically how people survive or not based upon um, the educational um, opportunities we provide them. And it, it really, uh, for me, affirmed my fight over time to say we have to stop um, training people in these like minimum wage jobs and to look at the high wage, high demand. But anyway, all that is to say, because I'm not saying it anywhere near as well as, as she did, is to request um, a future board presentation on this same information. So, because it, it was just really clear about the track that we put young people on or adults how it impacts them and their ability to feed their families and whether or not they're dependent on, on us through our tax dollars. And so it's just a request for, for you to see this presentation that I saw and learn from it. Uh, how long does that presentation take? I think it was about a half hour. Is it available on video? It was probably videoed. CSC's presentation was probably videoed. But then the only person you see asking questions is me. So you wouldn't want that. You would want the opportunity to ask your own questions. I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, you're our representative on CSC. So. I am. <laughs> but sure just like with the, the right students, questions. we need all the voices to make sure that everyone hears everything, right? So. So it's a request. I, I guess the way to do it would be to ask Mr. Burke to speak okay, with Lisa about the timing and all. We do with the anti-Semitism. Okay. Mm -hmm. Superintendent said he'll look into seeing if okay, we can get the you. information. I was just thinking it might fit very well at a retreat if we're doing one coming up soon. I know we uh, usually do we'll one do before, um, you know, the new school year or somewhere around there. It might be a, a good, a good thing for us to add in. Oh. All right. If there's nothing else, we'll take a motion to, Mr. Superintendent, do you have anything else? Yes, sir. No. We'll take a motion to adjourn. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, seconded by Ms. Ayala. All in favor? Opposed? This meeting is adjourned at 7.29 p.m. Thank you. So I'm there to help them be as creative as they can to, get, to gain that knowledge for future. So again, I want to thank everybody in my career that I've, I've come in contact with. Um, if you don't have a STEM program at school, whether it's robotics, 